confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you are here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. In the event of emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. Uh, may we please call the bylaws? Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, Charter Bylaw 20703, an administrative amendment to address errors in Charter Bylaw 20001 that corrects the zoning of sites in Garneau, Ambleside, and Paisley? The proposed zones will be effective January 1st, 2024. I have no one in either favor or opposition. Great. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. It, items 3.2 and 3.3 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, bylaw 20680, to amend the Pilot Powell Industrial Area Structure Plan, or item 3.3, charter bylaw 20681, to allow for the development of medium industrial uses, Pilot Powell Industrial? I have no speakers registered in favor or opposed. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Item 3.4 and item 3.5 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, bylaw 20693, to amend the Winterburn Industrial Area Structure Plan, or item 3.5, charter bylaw 20694, to allow for the development of an animal hospital, veterinary services, small animal breeding boarding facility, apartment hotels up to three units, and commercial uses within one building, Winterburn Industrial Area East. We have two speakers registered in favor. We have Dave Onishenko to answer questions only from Clark Development in person. And Ronan Soans to answer questions only, Clark Development in person, though there is a note that there is a presentation available if council would, would request that. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Is and, there any? And there is no one opposed. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 20661, to allow for the development of a low density residential housing, open space, and shared use path, Glastonbury? Yes, we have two speakers registered in favor Catherine Chopko Beck to answer questions only with Arcadis in person and Michael Rise to answer questions only, Arcadis in person. Okay. And there is no one registered in opposition. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Item 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7, bylaw 20666, to amend the Edgemont Neighborhood Area Structure Plan? Item 3.8, charter bylaw 20667, to allow for the development of a stormwater management facility. The A and AP zones will allow for the protection of and preservation of natural areas and public park uses, Edgemont. Or item 3.9, charter bylaw 20668, to allow low density residential uses, street oriented residential uses, public parks, and stormwater management facility, Edgemont. Yes, we have several speakers registered in favor. We have Doug Vandenbrink to answer questions only, Rohit Group Remote. Doug, are you here? Yes, I am. Good morning. Jim Kilo to answer questions only, Rohit Group Remote. Jim? Yes. Yes, good morning. Yolanda Liu, Stantec, uh, remote. Good morning. And just to confirm, you have a presentation, Ms. Liu? Uh, yes, if selected. If selected, okay, great. Keith Davies, to answer questions only, Stantec, remote. Yes, good morning, hello. Dylan Hunchak, to answer questions only, Anthem Properties, remote. Dylan, are you with us? Yes, he is. Great. Kevin Bacchus to answer questions only. Anthem Properties Remote. In Kevin? Person. He's in person as well. He's in person, perfect. And Keith Davies with Stantec to answer questions only. Remote. Yes, hello again. 
Oh yes, I see your name is here twice. Okay. So we have a duplication there, clerk. And then there is no one in opposition registered to speak on this item. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Items 3.10, 3.11, and 3.12 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, bylaw 20688 to amend the Dakota Area Structure Plan? Item 3.11, bylaw 20689 to amend the Meltwater Neighborhood Structure Plan? Or item 3.12, Charter bylaw 20690 to allow for a variety of small scale housing, low rise multi unit housing, low intensity commercial uses, stormwater management facility, and a school site meltwater. Yes, we have Emma Zurowell to answer questions only with Invistech Consulting Limited in person. We have Stephen Yu to answer questions only with Invistech Consulting Limited in person. And Ruben Ross to answer questions only in Visitech Consulting Limited in person. And Scott Mackey to answer questions only in person. And we do have um, uh, for, for speakers in opposition, we have Kim Green on behalf of Fred Duke, remote. Kim, are you there? Yes, I am here. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Item 3.13 and 3.14 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.13 bylaw 20684 to amend the Chappelle Neighborhood Area Structure Plan or item 3.14 charter bylaw 20685 to allow for parks, public utilities, and a range of low density and multi-unit housing, Chappelle? Yes, we have Connor Pope to answer questions only with Arcadis in person. Brad Clark to answer questions only with Anthem United Krupa Developments Limited or LP, sorry, in person. And then Dylan Hunchak to answer questions only with Anthem United Krupa Developments LP in person. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Item 3.15 and 3.16 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.15 bylaw 20695 to amend the Secord Neighborhood Structure Plan or item 3.16 charter bylaw 20696 to allow for the development of medium density housing up to 16 meters, four stories in the form of a multi-unit single family and semi-detached residential development Secord. Yes, in favor we have Belinda Morale Smith with dialogue design in person. And I see that it says presentation available, so I'm guessing only if selected. Then we have Tyler Dixon to answer questions only, dialogue design in person. He is participating remote today. He is remote. Tyler, are you online? I am online, yes. Thank you. And Bella Belchristian to answer questions only. College Woods remote. Bala, are you here? Yes, I am here. Perfect. Thank you so much. And there is no one registered in opposition. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Item 3.17 and 3.18 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.17 bylaw 20691 to amend the Cashman Neighborhood Area Structure Plan or item 3.18 charter bylaw 20692 to allow for medium rise multi unit housing Cashman? Yes, uh, in favor, we have Connor Pope to answer questions only with Arcadis in person, Michaela Davies to answer questions only, Melkor Developments in person. Catherine Chopko Beck to answer questions only, Arcadis in person. 
and Catherine Oberg to answer questions only, Bunt Engineering Remote. Good morning. Good morning. And there are no speakers registered in opposition on this item. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.19, bylaw 20686, to close a portion of road Queen Mary Park? Yes, we have Ashfaq Ahmed with the City of Edmonton, remote. Are you with us, Ashfaq? We have, we'll come back to that. We have Matthew Ivany to answer questions only with the city of Edmonton. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Sam L. Motar to answer questions only, city of Edmonton, remote. Good morning, Councillor Rutherford, present. And thank you. And Nathan Stelmack to answer questions only, city of Edmonton, remote. Present. Perfect, thank you. And there is, no one registered in opposition on this item. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.20? Um, oh, oh, sorry, item 3.20 and item 3.21 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.20 bylaw 20682 to amend the Strathcona area redevelopment plan or item 3.21 charter bylaw 20683 to allow low rise multi unit housing Strathcona? Yes, in favor, we have Zahir. Shivji to answer questions only in person. And there is no one else registered to speak in opposition or in favor. Thank you, Council Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.22, Charter Bylaw 20687 to allow for medium rise multi unit housing, Prince Rupert? Yes, we have Allison Roseland, Roseland, Situate Incorporated. Good morning. Thank you for being here. We have Jeff Booth with Situate Incorporated Remote. Good morning. Jeff. And we'll, we'll all just be giving our presentations if the item is selected. Yes, thank you very much. Sibpain Panju to answer questions only. Pragma Incorporated. Remote. Yes, I'm here to answer any questions. Perfect. And in Sia Panju, Pragman Inc. Remote. Uh, yes, I'm here as well. And again, I only uh, need to get my presentation back and selected. Perfect. Thank you so much. And there are no speakers in, uh, registered in opposition on this item. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.23, Charter Bylaw 20701, to allow for low-intensity commercial uses, Montrose? Yes, we have Gil Fee to answer questions only in person. And James Stafford to answer questions only in person. And then, are you ready to, for me to move on to speakers in opposition? Chair Martin? Yes. And then we have Aelia Chandra on behalf of Pranita Chandra in person. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Items 3.24, 3.25 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.24, Ogilvy Ridge Municipal Reserve Removal, or item 3.25, Charter Bylaw 20679, to allow for ground oriented housing and the continued use of existing park space, Ogilvy Ridge? Sure. We have Neil Ozadiak to answer questions only with the City of Edmonton, remote. I am here. Yes, great. Thank you. Crystal Jenner to answer questions only, City of Edmonton remote. Crystal, are you here? We'll come back to that. Stuart Kerrig to answer questions only, City of Edmonton remote. 
present and also uh, Crystal will be available when the time is up. When the time is up, that's understandable. Rhinel Comia to answer questions only, City of Edmonton remote. Good morning, I'm here. Perfect, thank you so much. And then we have Danish Peshpand, Home Ed, Populous Green Space Alliance in person. Good morning, Councillor Rufford. Yes, uh, our team is uh, right now online, but we will be uh, there in person when the time is up. Perfect. Uh, Nick Lilly with Home Ed Populous Green Space Alliance. Yes, yes, same for everyone in our okay. team. Okay, perfect. Jonathan Lay, Home Ed Populous Green Space Alliance. And Beth Sanders, Home Ed Populous Green Space Alliance. Good morning, and just a note that we will present if the item is selected. Yes, and it's a joint presentation, I understand. Yes, thank you. Okay. And there are no speakers registered in opposition on this item. Clerk Martin. Thank you. Um, and finally, is there anyone to speak to item 3.26 bylaw 20627 to repeal the Mistatum area structure plan, the Hollywood corridor area structure plan, and the Calgary trail land use study? There are no speakers registered in favor or in opposition on this item. Well, thank you so much, Councillor Rutherford, for uh, uh, starting the proceeding and uh, carrying on with, uh, with the business of the day. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, I'll take the chair back and uh, we'll go to exemptions, right? Selections. Please go ahead, colleagues. <clears throat> Council Salvador. Uh, I'd like to select 3.23, please. 3.23, right? Anyone else? Huh? Yeah, the okay, Councillor Wright. Yeah, could I select three ten, three eleven, and three twelve, please? Three ten, eleven, and twelve. Councillor Rice. Uh thank you, Mayor Salhi. I would like to select three point Three, 3.13, 3.14, that's just deal with together. And also 3.17 and um, 3.18, that deal with together as well. Thank can, you. Con sorry, Councilor Rice, can you start again? I was, wasn't able to flip my page. Start. Uh, 3.13 and 3.14, that's deal with together. 3.13, 3.14, yeah. And and it's three point one seven and it's three point one eight. Let's do this together. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Paquet. Oh yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will select three point two two. Three point two two. Yes. Okay. Have we missed Clerk any? Uh, bylaws that are we have members to speak to or in opposition or favor all the items with speakers in opposition have been selected Got it. administration has provided a reply replacement attachment for item 3.7 which we're just processing okay. so council may consider passing a motion to add that to the agenda before considering closure and, and first readings of that item 3.7. Okay, someone move that. Mr. 
Just think so about, moved. I'll move that the December 11th, 2023 City Council Public Hearing Meeting Agenda be adopted with the following change. Uh, replacement attachment on item 3.7, bylaw 20666 to amend the Edgemont Neighborhood Area <coughs> Structure Plan, attachment one. Can you need a second? Councillor Salvador, okay, please vote. We have all the votes. I display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move, first of all, oh, I got to do this in order. Okay. So I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6. Three point six, three point seven, three point eight, three point nine, three point fifteen, three point sixteen, three point nineteen, three point twenty, three point twenty one, three point twenty four, three point twenty five, and three point twenty six. Need a seconder. Second. Councillor Rice, please vote. Just waiting on one boat. <coughs> Councilor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I will first move the recommendation in item 3.24. Thank you. Second. Second by Councilor Rice. Uh, please vote. We're just getting the vote loaded. Here we are. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. And that is carried. Mayor Sophie, I'll move. I was First read. I'm sorry, Councillor Rutherford, do you have something? I was here okay. and okay. it wouldn't let me vote. And it said I was absent. We can correct that on the record, Councillor Rutherford. Can you confirm your vote? It was a yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead Councillor Cardinal. Okay. I'll move uh, first reading, Mayor Sohi, of items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. 3.4, 3 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 3.15, 3.16, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.25, and 3.26. Second. Please vote. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of those aforementioned items. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of those aforementioned items. Second. Please vote.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sophie, I will move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20703, Bylaw 20680, Charter Bylaw 20681, Bylaw 20693, Charter Bylaw 20694, Charter Bylaw 20661, Bylaw 20666, Charter Bylaw 20667, Charter Bylaw 20668, Bylaw 20695, Charter Bylaw 20696, Bylaw 20686, Bylaw 20682, Charter Bylaw 20683, Charter Bylaw 20679, and bylaw 20627. Second. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Okay, we are on to now our first item, which is bylaw 20688 to amend the deco area structure plan, and bylaw 20689 to amend the meltwater neighborhood structure plan. They are, oops. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. 3, 10 first, and 11 and 12 all together. Thank you. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'll go to administration for a presentation. Good morning. This application proposes to facilitate development in the Meltwater neighborhood to allow for small-scale and low-rise multi-unit housing, commercial uses, a school site, and a stormwater management facility. On January 1, 2024, the RMD-RA7-CB1 and the U.S. zone will become the RSF, RMH16, CN, and PS zones under zoning bylaw 2001 and it is under these zones that future development will occur. As such, this presentation will focus on the future zones in the new zoning bylaw. An amendment to the Dikoto Area Structure Plan and the Meltwater Neighborhood Structure Plan is proposed to facilitate this rezoning. Next slide, please. The site is currently undeveloped and is located east of 50th Street Southwest and north of 22nd Avenue Southwest. It is bounded by agricultural zone parcels to the north, south, and east with 50th Street Southwest and single detached housing in the west. Transit is currently available along 50th Street and shared pathways are available along 50th Street and Ellisley Road. Two mass transit routes are expected to operate along 50th streets in the future. Next slide, please. As part of public engagement for this application, a rezoning information sign was installed on the site and notices were mailed to surrounding landowners and the Horizon Community League. One response was received with concerns about the impact of stormwater management facility on the property not of the subject sites. Next slide, please. The proposed ROSF and ROMH16 zones will allow for a variety of small-scale housing and multi-unit housing while allowing a 12-meter and 16-meter tall building. The CN, PU, and PS zones complement the residential zones by providing commercial development, schools, parks, and stormwater management infrastructure to serve the neighborhood. Overall, 
The proposed zones are compatible with the surrounding and planned land uses. Next slide, please. This application proposes amendments to the Meltwater Neighborhood Structure Plan by reconfiguring the school sites and residential land uses, as well as redesignating the western portion of the sites from mixed-use developments to commercial and medium-density residential developments. The proposal supports housing diversity in the neighborhood and contributes to the plant's density targets. Amendments to the DECO2 area structure plan are also being proposed to align with the Meltwater NSP. In addition, the proposed development aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan by meeting regional density targets and accommodating future growths within Edmonton's existing boundaries. Next slide, please. Administ administration recommends that this proposal be approved because it aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan, facilitates development that conforms to the vision and goals of the DECO2 area structure plan and the Meltwater NSP, and is compatible with the surrounding and planned land uses. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we have three folks registered in favor from uh, Investic uh, uh, Consulting, but they are here to answer questions only. So I'll ask council members if there are questions to folks in favor. Not at this time. I'd like to For new to information? The, okay, no worries. The okay. Then we'll go to uh, a member of the public signed in opposition, Kim Green, on behalf of Fred Duke joining us remotely. Uh, Kim Green, are you there? Yes, I am here. Yeah, please go ahead. You have five minutes to make your presentation. Then there might be questions from council members after that. Thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity yeah. to speak on this behalf. Uh, first, I, I do want to note that we are not in opposition to the development of the land south of our property, which is 1845 50th Street. 1911 50th Street, we do have some concerns and we'd like some assurances as to the drainage infrastructure, which includes the stormwater pond, which does border directly our south, our south border, their north. And in your diagrams, you would notice, um, I think it was the second one that they pulled up, but page 169 of the planning report that was available to us. Um, it does, uh, border directly that stormwater pond where our current dwelling is, our house where we reside, as well as we'd like to get some drainage infrastructure uh, engineering plans prior to any uh, permits being per, uh, authorized, just so that we can have a chance to go over them and ensure or have some kind of assurance that there's not going to be any backflow onto our property, which is gonna disrupt where our livestock reside, feed, where their shelters are at, as well as where our dwelling is. So with that, if we're looking at soil foundation, soil grading, and the stormwater draining, as it will impact our land and our residents. So these are our concerns. The other concern we have is on the planning report as well page number, so it's easy reference, is 194. The amendment area diagram that's showing does have a bit of a peak that goes up off the north of that property into our property for the south. And there's been no discussion with Fred or myself as to the use of any of his land as to this amended diagram that's being shown here. And we would just like a better understanding of what this diagram is indicating. Because if it's indicating use of Fred's land, that has not been granted. So those are our concerns and our, the assurances that we would like to have. Thank you for allowing us to voice our concerns and I hope they can be addressed and that we can be granted to have some engineering designs sent to us so that we would have copies of them before any planning 
before the infrastructure starts and begins as to the impact on our land. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and sharing your concerns. Uh, uh, I'll go to Councillor Wright. She has some questions uh, to you. Go ahead, Councillor Wright. Hi, Ms. Green. Thank you very much for um, coming online today. Um, so would you, I, and I, I guess I'll ask some questions um, with your concerns um, back to the developers and, and administration. Um, so would you like us to hold off until we get that drainage infrastructure plans before making any decision on this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, if you look at the, the diagram, the second one that they had, I, I believe the slide that they had shown, right? There is natural pond and stuff to their southwest border. So it's going to be a huge impact when they start piling earth and stuff. Where are they going to pile it? How are they going to grade that down? Because that is the high point zone where where, which is now gone, they have demolished the, the building that used to be there and cleaned that property up, but it borders ours, like our dwelling. If you actually look at the Google Maps site, mm -hmm. our house is right on that borderline. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I see that there. And, and I was also concerned too, because there does seem to be some other sort of natural yes. water, water, I'll call them Substantial sl amount. <laughs> if you actually look at yeah. it, it's going right through it, between the two it, properties. It, Yes, yes, Okay. even further up and even to their southwest border of the 119 50th Street, there's natural pond, there's a pond there, very large pond as well as natural water reserves as well on that end. So um, yeah, uh, the backflow, we, we are really concerned about that because that could potentially disrupt where we're gonna live, like, you know, if, yeah. it, if it backflows. Yeah, I can see how that would be a concern. Okay, I don't think I have any other questions for you. I, I will um, maybe um, have some other ones here now for admin and for, I think mm -hmm. it's in Viztech, is it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Mrs. Wright. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Wright. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Just a couple of questions to... Uh, 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 sure, to, uh, I have the chair. Yeah, so I just wanna know, like the, uh, were you or, or Fred, uh, uh, were you able to engage uh, during the consultation process with the uh, with the applicant and the and the city? If you were, were you able to raise those concerns and get any answers? Uh, the, we did raise a concern. Um, the city planner Gilbert uh, Kwashishim. I apologize if I pronounced his last name wrong. Uh, and he, he did provide us just a, a short thing about um, that the city EPCOR engineering design standards had to be met and adhered to. So, and this is one of the reasons why we're requesting when those documents are produced, we would like to have a viewing of them. Just, you know, we want some assurances. Like we said, we're, we're not opposed to, to the development of the land. We're just concerned as to the impact that that's going to have on our land. So if we can have some assurances before permits are granted that we, we can see that those designs, those engineering proposals, so that we can be a little bit more at ease as to the progress of that, that would be really good for us. I see. Okay. So at the, at the, ne at the future steps, right? When, uh, those permits Correct. are applied, you want to have access to those documents to better understand the impact on your dwelling, your property, and- Yes, uh, okay. yes, and, and if you look at, um, in the initial planning, it's, it's supposed to, in theory, that it's supposed to be a pawn that actually does encompass where Fred's house is as well. Mm -hmm. But right now, Fred still resides here. So, the, you know, what, what kind of amendments are going to get made to this, if you want to say half a pond, partial pond, and how is that going to impact? If they have to build a half a pond, you know, what's that impact going to be, especially with, you know, the proposed buildings that are going to be there, right? Yeah. Apartment buildings that, 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 like, we're not opposed to those buildings being built. It's just that with the, the impact that that, partial water uh, draining system is going to have on our property. 
Got to it. both our livestock as well as us, Got it. right? If it floods the fields where the livestock grazes, mm -hmm. as well as their shelters, as well as their water sources, um, that's going to be a huge impact on Fred. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so that concludes the questions to you. You can uh, stay around because uh, there might be some questions arising out of further discussion uh, out of this topic. So if you can, please do stick around. Uh, Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, and the folks, some folks are leaving. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for visiting us. And uh, uh, I hope you're enjoying your stay in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, Bye. Okay, we'll go to questions to administration at this time. Councilor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, so Ms. Green did mention that there was consultation um, through the process here. But her request for um, sort of referring this back until um, more work is done, is that a possibility that? Councillor Wright, uh, the designs are done after, uh, uh, after the rezoning happens. Uh, there are subsequent stages wherein uh, at the subdivision stage, the conditions would be formalized and then the designs would happen. So. Uh, Ideally, the rezoning should go first, then they get the green light to do the subdivision and put in those conditions to ensure that there is no flooding on her property or due tranches. And subsequent to that, uh, the designs would be finalized. Okay. So ideally, that would be the process, yeah. but could we go outside that process and have those done prior? Uh, I, I would not uh, recommend doing that. So. So how can I? How can we give her assurance that, and and Mr. Duke assurance that, uh, that 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 they will be properly addressed? Does she have any input, or and or Mr. Duke have any input at that time? Councillor, typically they don't have much input at that time, but we we do have a, a set of quality assurances all the way through this. It starts today with getting the rezoning in place. Uh, that, uh, that enables further more detailed analysis, particularly in terms of drainage and the, the lot grading that needs to go on. There's a substantial amount of work that needs to go on to this site. Um, I think the, it might be best to ask the applicant for some assurances that none of that water will spill over. But certainly through our uh, review, the administration, we look at that uh, no water, no drainage is, go is going across lot. It appears that most of the water, the drainage will be uh, dealt with on their own site at this time. Okay, and so, so Ep, I'm sorry, and I just want to understand this a little bit. So EPCOR will provide the drainage engineering report? No, the drainage okay. engineering report would be provided by the consultant, in this case, Investec Consulting. Okay. That would be reviewed by city reviewers. Standard practice is to make sure that there is no negative impact on the surrounding properties. Okay. I don't know if that provides sufficient uh, and and maybe I'll, I'll come back and 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 ask the um, ask right, if, later. I, if I may add further okay. this is a standard practice we have any new development area uh, storm pond typically straddles uh, two different properties so as to ensure uh, development of each property with their own piece in case someone wants to go first right. and uh, uh, Th th this practice has been going on for the past number of years and there's a robust mechanism in place to make sure that there are no negative impacts on the surrounding properties. Okay. And, and what about the other water, other pockets of water um, along that, sort of along the, the border between them? So as and when the development happens, uh, the first step is grading wherein earth is moved mm -hmm. and the drainage pattern changes so that everything would be directed to the future pond and that pond is created of a uh, sufficient size to accommodate all the water that is anticipated in a hundred year event. For context, the last hundred year event uh, of that scale for which it would be designed happened in 1978. 
So day-to-day -day storms, 100% uh, of the water will go to the future pond and it will be pumped out or drained out in an orderly fashion. So you'll be grading towards from the, e from the east to the west then? All, like all those other little pockets of water or? Th that's correct, east to the west as well as south to the north and certain part of the road, road drainage would also be directed to the storm pond. So east to the west, south to the north would put Mr. Duke's house right at sort of the... No, his, his it, property line would remain. Uh, there would be no uh, activity happening along, uh, like at the property line. It will be south of the property line. Uh, okay. Uh, now, now I, I failed to ask if, the, if, the, if those other pockets of water were, were needed for the operation of the ranch. So okay. Mr. Duke's property will not be impacted by any of this. this all this develop, all the grading would be restricted to the applicant's property. Okay, but there's pockets of water along the border between the two properties. So, Councillor, just I may add, um, the general the scheme of planning, uh, in terms of uh, the neighbourhood plan, we asked for a neighbourhood uh, design report, uh, which outlines all the drainage network for the neighbourhood as it's developed. These are refined as we go through the planning process. Uh, so for instance here we're at the rezoning. Uh, so we have a further refinement in the rezoning and then at the subdivision phase uh, there is additional studies that are required to ensure as Mr. Tawana said that the, the drainage itself is uh, restricted to the area of application. So in this case drainage won't go over into Mr. Duke's ranch. Um, it's only uh, affected uh, for the parcel that is being uh, graded or being under subdivision. Uh, so there's bylaws and rules in place to ensure that that cross lot drainage doesn't happen and follows the, the larger neighborhood design report, which is the drainage for the overall neighborhood. So it can be staged as development happens. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back. Thank yeah, no worries. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Maybe just want to dig in a little bit further on on the sequencing so again just my understanding is that this is um, sort of the standard process so zoning comes first um, and then um, you know I think one of the the challenges is that unless we're doing a direct control zone we can't really attach conditions to a rezoning process is that correct that's correct okay and so you know where we actually get those assurances, get that that detail, and um, you know, really that that assurance that I think the neighboring property is looking for comes at at the subdivision stage. Is that correct? That is correct. And we can't subdivide before we have zoning. That is correct. Okay, okay. Well, I think I think that helps clarify for me. I think you know, wanting to ensure that there there are those um, you know assurances and and safety built into the process. I I fully understand that, but it sounds like following this process allows that to happen. Yes. That is correct. Great. Okay, well, thank you. That, that clarifies for me. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? I just want to follow up on that for the Councillor Stevenson. So what, sure, I have the chair. so what assurances are available at the subdivision level to ensure that the impact that uh, Speaker Green and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Fred Duke, on, who, on whose behalf she's also speaking, uh, what assurances are there at the subdivision level? So here at the subdivision level, there's a number of conditions that are put on um, through servicing, through entering into servicing agreements with the city. They go through a, a substantial amount of review, and we look at them from the engineering perspective to make sure that no water is overflowing uh, from this, that the storm pond is actually appropriately sized just to serve this area. Okay. And would that also, for example, there'll be further studies done, right? Would, is there an obligation to share those studies with uh, the adjacent property owners by the applicant? I wouldn't say there's an obligation. They, they, may, they may wish to. They may wish to um, let them know certainly what's, what's happening on their land or how it's, how it's all going to come into effect. Um, I don't think there's any obligation to, so, to do that. Okay, so there's no obligation, but how does adjacent property owners know whether those conditions that you talked about are being met, right? So what is the communication? Certainly, they, they can contact us or the file planner on this who will share with them the, the letter of subdivision support, which lays out all the conditions that are required. There's also a number of maps showing the, the extent of the area that's being serviced. 
Um, for this case, they may not service the entire area at this time. They may only okay. service a small portion. So the maps around subdivision, uh, that, is that public information? It is For, indeed, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. So yes. pro adjacent property owners, if they're, you know, in this case, they are really pay, playing, paying close attention, which is absolutely necessary, right, for their for the protection. So they can either talk to city staff, review the documents online, right, and uh, hopefully the, you know, good neighbors always share information with neighbors. Hopefully the, uh, the, uh, uh, invest folks or the landowners that are developing now or seeking rezone, uh, rezoning probably share that information as uh, as good neighbors. Correct. As Is a, that happens though? Like it, it does just, quite frequently, yes, okay, as yeah. development proceeds. They let each other know what's okay, happening. Yes. Okay, yep. good. All right. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Uh, I will take the chair back. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll move the second the round. I'll, I'll move the second round first. Second? Okay, I have the chair again. Okay, uh, we have a second round. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried, and I will return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you. Before um, I ask, questions um, to the proponents for new on new information. I just wanted to add, talk to Admin about just a couple of other things. Um, in, reg <clears throat> in regards to the, um, the, the future school, um, it says that, um, sorry, the, the, the changing the road frontage um, would impact the drop-off area. And I'm just, with, with so many schools um, across the city that have problems with uh, student drop-off and pick-up and congestion and everything, I'm just wondering if that has been addressed with the school boards. Thank that's, you. That's correct, uh, Councillor. That has been uh, um, discussed and addressed. Okay, and they have no concerns with it? Uh, the application did change to accommodate the request. Uh, so in order to give a little bit more in terms of the frontage, uh, some negotiated position was taken by the applicant and that was acceptable. Okay, and they feel they can provide adequate drop-off areas in that. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome, thank you. And then the other thing was in regards to um, the, um, the, the mass transit bus route. And I know this is way off into the future, um, but what would be required for that, for that assessment to be done? I, I'm assuming there's nothing in place right now. There is nothing in place right now, plus um, uh, currently there is uh, a study underway uh, to look into 1.25 million mass transit network and uh, whatever uh, corridor improvements are necessary to be attached to it, uh, that work will come uh, forward uh, next year. We'll be getting that, or that'll be done completed next year? Uh, that's my understanding. Because it'd be real easy for the LRT to just turn right on 50th Street and come all the way down, right? <laughs> yeah, I know that's a long way off. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions I have. I will then ask um, on yeah. new information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, I want to welcome uh, some guests that are visiting us. University of Alberta Global Academic Development Program. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you staying around for a little bit at the City Hall or just for a quick visit? For, for, for a quick visit, sorry? Okay, good. Well, enjoy your visit, okay? We're talking about zoning bylaws, right, to land use planning. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, now I will ask council members if they have any questions arising out of the previous discussion. Uh, responding to any new information. Constant right. Thank you very much. So I guess my questions are to the uh, contingency from uh, Invistech. Does somebody want to come down? We'll uh, pause Councillor Wright's time, please. Thank you. 
or we'll, we'll start all over again with Councillor Wright's time, no worries. Okay, all right, Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you very much. So you've heard the concerns of Ms. Green and you've been in consultation uh, with her and Mr. Duke, have you, over this process? We only became aware of the concern uh, just in the last week. Um, certainly we're prepared to uh, uh, consult if required um, for the consultation. Appreciate that the, the engineering design process has not even yet started. So it's, it's premature to, I guess, to even come up with or tell her what the answer is, but uh, we certainly would um, want to make sure that the, uh, their concerns were addressed. Okay, so you do plan then on, on consulting back with her or, or providing her the information, getting her feedback when you do get the, the engineering? Yeah, we will work with city engineering staff to make sure that all the city design standards are met and in doing so we'll uh, address those concerns. Okay, but will you connect directly with her? We would likely do that through the city. Through the city, okay. Um, and then so I guess to Ms. Green, does that, yes. does that satisfy you? Uh, yes, if we can have some, some communication and, and be able to see some diagrams and have them explain and stuff in their entirety to us before it proceeds, that would be really, really helpful to us. We, we do have some viable concerns because with the demolition of the house and stuff that had happened, it, it happened in the middle of the night, like at 1.30 in the morning. Um, so even addressing anything through the city, it was kind of too late when they did that. So th these are some of our concerns is we just want to make sure that things are going to be done um, with respect to um, how it is going to impact and what impacts may occur to our property going forward. Okay, and to our administration, that's, you can consult with her or provide the information from InvisTech and along the way? Yes, that is correct, Councillor. Okay, got a commitment, perfect. Um, I think, thank that, you. Okay, I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much, all. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions on new information. At this time, we are ready to close the public hearing on these bylaws. Councillor Wright? Yes, I would like to move closure on item 310, 311, and 312, please. Second. Second by Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. Just getting the vote loaded. So we're just having technical difficulties. Bear with us. Here we go, we can vote now, please. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'd like to move first reading on bylaw, or sorry, items 310, 311, and 312. Councillor Stevenson, second. Second. Thank you. We have the first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Councillor Wright to close. Sure. Um, I, you know, this is a, um, I, I appreciate the concerns that were brought, brought forward by Ms. Green on behalf of Mr. Duke. Um, and understand uh, how those concerns arise. And I appreciate the commitment by bo both InvisTech and, and our city administration to consider that. 
um, or continue that conversation um, and consultation uh, with Ms. Green and Mr. Duke. Um, so with that, I will um, call for second reading. Okay, thank you. Please vote for the first reading. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Wright. Now I'll move second reading. Second. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move consideration of third reading. Second by Councillor Stevenson. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move third and final reading on bylaw 20688, bylaw 20689, charter bylaw 20690. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, all right, that is done. Next one are bylaw three one by so three point one three and three point one four bylaw two zero six eight four to amend the Chappelle neighborhood area structure plan and charter bylaw two zero six eight five to allow for park parks, public utilities, and range of low density and multi unit housing Chappelle exempted by Councillor Rice, and I'll see if there are, uh, there's no one in opposition, and the, uh, Councillor Rice, would you like to have a presentation from administration? Oh, uh, yeah, please. Okay, please, go ahead. Good morning. This application proposes to rezone a site in the Chappelle neighborhood from the AG zone to the A zone, AP zone, PU zone, RSL zone, and the RA7 zone. This proposal will allow for parks, public utilities, and a range of low density and multi-unit housing. On January 1st, 2024, these zones will become the A, PSN, PU, ROSF, and ROMH16 zone and it is under these zones that future development will occur. An amendment to the Chappelle Neighborhood Area Structure Plan will facilitate this rezoning. Next slide, please. The site is undeveloped and located in the northwest corner of the Chappelle Neighborhood. White Mud Creek Ravine is to the west of the site. Transit service is available within a seven minutes walk on Chappelle Green Southwest and a shared path pathway runs east along the adjacent stump pond. Low density residential housing is currently under development to the east of the sites. Next slide, please. As part of public engagement for this application, notices were sent to surrounding landowners and community leagues. A rezoning sign was installed and information was posted on the city's website. Five responses were received with four in opposition and one with questions only. Concerns were expressed about multi-unit housing, increased traffic congestion, street safety, and effects on the adjacent creek and ravine system. Next slide, please. Under zoning bylaw 20001, the proposed ROA7 zone will become the ROMH16 zone 
which includes the same maximum height of 16 meters and a slightly smaller front and rear setbacks. The uses and regulations of the proposed ROSL zones are similar to those of the ROSF zone and remain compatible with the surrounding and planned land uses. Next slide, please. The proposed amendment to the Chapelle NASP will increase the area dedicated to low rise, medium density housing, realign atop top of bank pathway, dedicate new park space, and add a walkway connection through a greenway to the future 28th Avenue Southwest extension. In addition, this proposal aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan by providing a variety of housing types and contributing to the development of network pathways that support active transportation, which connects the sites to the ravine system, open spaces, and other existing or planned pathways. Next slide, please. In closing, administration supports this application because it provides the opportunity to increase housing diversity in the Chappelle neighborhood, facilitates the assembly of a park sites, and aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan to preserve and protect the river valley and ravine system and to accommodate all future growth for an additional 1 million people within Edmonton's existing boundaries. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, <coughs> the, the folks signed in favor are to answer questions only. At this time, I will ask if council members have questions to the uh, uh, folks in favor of the application. Councilor Rice, you have questions to uh, the applicant? Okay. Yes. Go ahead, please, Councilor Rice. And I'll ask the, I'll see uh, just Connor Pope to answer questions only. If you could step up, please. And uh, Brad Clark, and uh, as well as Dylan, Dylan Hunchock. All right, Councilor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here today and to answer the question. Uh, I was on site uh, back to the summer uh, to have the site meeting with some uh, residents around this development site. Uh, there are some questions. Um, I believe there are follow-up uh, conversation as well. Uh, I have few questions I want to ask to get a, uh, confirmation and clarification on it. Thank you very much. Uh, the first one is about uh, the RA7 zone. So RA7 zone right now, and then we would like some like, clarification on, is only about the apartment or the different type of housing because it's a, a multi-union housing and then we would like to get some clarification. I can probably speak to that. So um, maybe I'll just clarify the question. Is the question, what's the intended use on the two multifamily sites? Yes, RA, RA7. Okay, um, the RA7 sites will be uh, converted to the new uh, zones in the new year with the zoning bylaw renewal. Uh, so there'll be RM designation. Uh, we will follow the uh, zoning bylaws. We do not have um, purchasers for those two sites. So we will go to the open mark for purchase. Uh, whoever purchases those two multifamily sites will obviously have to follow the zoning bylaw. Uh, and the intent is they go from RA7, transition in the new year to RM. Uh, yes, I, that, that is, yes, that's his process. And the question is about is intended to build apartment only or to build a different type of housing? Well, we don't know who's going to purchase those sites, so it's difficult to say that at the moment. Uh, I believe the new zone would still accommodate uh, townhomes. There is minimum density, but those sites could accommodate townhomes, as well as high-rise, I believe, uh, if it's 12 or 16 meters, someone will have to uh, correct me on the height for those. 
Okay. So that is unknown at this moment. Right. Um, like the next question in terms of the concerning about street safety, um, as you can see around this area, the most are the uh, single housing. Uh, the younger families, lots of kids play on the street. Is there any plan and specific address this street safety uh, during the construction period and also for the land use perspective? I can I can speak to that. Um, the the construction will meet the city standards of these sites. So as as my colleagues have mentioned, there's no purchasers. So uh, the actual construction phase of the the higher density areas will 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 not commence immediately. Um, and and we've still got the the other processes to go through. Uh, but that the, the will will meet the uh, appropriate city standards in terms of of construction uh, safety and suitability for their road. Okay, uh, so a lot of questions about 28th Avenue. Uh, right now, the 28th Avenue and then there is not connected and between uh, the between the Chapnau Belvert Road and this 100 uh, 156 Street, 56th Street. So is not the um, developer's responsibility to ensure that road construction to be finished or is the city's responsibility? And in terms of load infrastructure for 28th Avenue and also for 156th Street. Uh, so future development will connect and uh, as part of this application, we have a corresponding road closure application with the city of Edmonton for uh, 156th Street where it will, will not actually connect to uh, 28, 28th Avenue Southwest. So 20, uh, 28th Avenue Southwest is not collected and will not be planned to collect it? Correct. So that means that as a result, the traffic will go through inside the neighborhood. Is that correct? That is correct. It will go through the designated collector roads through the neighborhood. Through neighborhoods, and that is a big concern right now. What I heard going back to the summertime when I was on site meeting and meet with the residents that is a big concern. And then, if the road going through the inside of the neighborhood, so right now there is no plan for that. Uh, yes, currently there is no plan for the extension of 28th Avenue, there is a, a process that the city uh, manages. Uh, to help determine when arterial roads would be expanded. So when when there is, uh, I guess, sufficient traffic to warrant the extension of 28th Avenue, that crossing would occur. Thank you. Okay, that's my question and to applicants. I, I will follow up with administration. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Yes, I have the chair. I just uh, have a couple of questions on the uh, where AG to RA7 is situated. One is absolutely backs on to uh, some of the green space, the ravine, the creek, right? The other AG RA7 goes to 156th Street. Then you have surrounded by single family, right? RSL. Is there a rationale for that, uh, having more RSL close to the ravine? <laughs> green space, but not RA7 close to the green space? So if I understand the question correctly, are you asking why the RSL is not backing on? Yeah, why RA7 is not backing on to the ravine instead of single family? Well, the RA7 can back on to the, uh, back onto the greenway, giving uh, a, buff a buffer space in between the uh, current developments in uh, in the Eastern Chappelle area. And then the RSL area uh, along the Greenway will have uh, uh, backyards looking on to, uh, onto the green space, giving it a more uh, uh, integrated feel with the, with the community and the, uh, and the river itself. Okay. I see. And what is AG to AP? That'll be a park. That's, that's, so that's kind of, so more green space being added to, to the creek, right? Yes. Okay, I see, okay. 
and same with AG to A? That is correct. Yes, okay, got it, okay. Mm. So there's more additional green space. On the uh, question of 28A Avenue, 28, 28, 8th Avenue Southwest being connected to 156th Street, that, that's a different owner's responsibility. That is not your client, right? Because, it, or is that land owned by your client? I can help add some clarity to that. Yeah. Uh, that land has been dedicated, so that roadway was previously dedicated with one of Anthem United's uh, subdivisions across uh, White Mud Creek and Brenton, so that has been dedicated as right-of-way. Um, the city uh, helps determine what uh, the strategy is for arterial roads. I believe the, the current number one priority is the expansion on Ellerslie Road east-west, uh, and then uh, there, there may be another priority before this one um, advances. So this is not a developer's responsibility then? Is a city responsibility, even though land is dedicated? The it's, construction is city responsibility? It's ultimately developers through the ARA program, okay. which the city helps facilitate and coordinate. Okay. So if that connection is not built, which is not now, how does the development on the site that we are considering adds to the neighborhood traffic? So it doesn't... Like, well, that's what I'm to understand, because your answer to Councillor Rice's question was that the traffic would be diverted through the neighborhood in the absence of 28th Avenue being not being built. Mm -hmm. So people would not be able to get to the neighborhood. Just trying to get that clarity. Yeah, it's, there's, there's existing development to the east. Um, it, it may be hard to tell with these high-level schematic drawings. But we will be connecting to an existing road to the east. Okay. And then there is existing development to the south, not immediately south of our parcel to date, but just slightly south. Oh, I so see. So our road is actually integral in connecting those two existing portions of development. Oh, so it, it's kind of a missing piece. So it really will help with the overall traffic flows within the neighborhood, okay. collecting that minor collector roadway. The, which is 28th Avenue, right? I uh, know it's, uh, it's not 28th Avenue, it's south of 28th. The Come collector south. roadway is Chernowski Way Southwest. It bends through the rezoning site. Okay, I see, okay. So it's not the the Chappelle Boulevard or Chappelle Green, that's separate too. Okay, got it, okay, good. All right, that's all, just need clarity on that. Thank you so much, and I will take the chair back. Chair return. And uh, at this time, I will, there's no one in opposition. I will ask council members if they have any questions uh, to administration at this time. Questions to administration. Councillor Rice, you have questions to administration? Yes, I'm, I try to sign in here. There you go. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohia. And for some of questions you asked, um, I, I just want to get a firmer, uh, further confirmation from city administration. Um, in terms of product overlay and for the Lower Saskatchewan River Valley and Riven system, um, so the current rezoning, can you tell me a little bit more? about how the current rezoning could protect this. And because this is so close to the revenge system. Thank you, Councillor. Um, certain portions of the rezoning area would be zoned from AG to A. The purpose of the A zone, the Metropolitan Recreation Zone, is to protect the river valley and the creek system. And also the AP zoning to the south also would add an extra layer of protection uh, to the ravine and river valley system. So those measures, th those zoning measures are in place to protect the ravine system. Uh, is, is it half of bank already finished or not yet? Uh, Council Rice, typically the top of bank is further determined at time of subdivision. Uh, we do go out and ground truth it uh, prior to rezoning. We have a good indication through survey. Um, though top of bank, whether it's top of bank road or top of bank walkway, will be dedicated upon further subdivision of these lines. Okay. Um, 
So if the further 156th Street will be closed to reporting of that, but how that impacts add the additional traffic through the neighborhood inside? Councillor, um, as mentioned by the applicant, uh, Cherosky Way, that is the collector that is uh, planned to serve this area uh, as per the approved NSP. Uh, 156 Street portions of it uh, have been closed already to the south uh, uh, and uh, there's a small portion to the north that is needed. Uh, otherwise, as far as this zoning area is concerned, this pocket is concerned, their primary access will be from Cherosky Way, which is uh, um, going to be designed as an enhanced local. Um, and I, I'll just quickly add that the change in NSP is not significant. What we are looking at overall is rejigging of uh, the medium density, and the overall change is around six units. Uh, um, this kind of uh, land use was always contemplated for this area, and hence uh, the collector network was planned. So I heard there is no purchase, purchase yet, and so why we need to approve this rezoning right now if there's no purchase and with some um lack of the detailed plan and for the for the extension of 28th avenue and also with the concern uh about the street safety and because the roads they're planning to use currently that area still under development the, as you can see on the map, and also I saw and the on site, and why we need to do this rezoning right now. Thank you, Councillor. Um, this rezoning actually uh, contributes to the orderly development of the neighborhood, and uh, approving this rezoning now would also help that connectivity piece as the Chernovsky Way Boulevard would connect to the south, would go through the rezoning area and loop to the south. So to answer your question, approving this rezoning now contributes to that orderly development of the neighborhood. Councillor, if I may add, uh, subsequent yeah. to rezoning, at the subdivision stage, there'll be a further requirement of uh, constructing appropriate uh, uh, transportation connections. So uh, that, that'll be a next logical step after the rezoning. So for the first requirement, and is there any specific, so what I heard here, we don't have a specific plan and then based on the current development in this area and I connect with 28th Avenue and also, um, do you have the specific plan when that east side? I heard the uh, connected to the east side and for the, Chams Chams Way and Southwest. That's road right now. That is the, the big road and is a planning to use and for this development to go in through the neighborhood. Uh, do we have that specific timeline for that piece? Councillor, just to clarify, you're asking about Chiroski yeah. Way. Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, that will be uh, required as part of the subdivision and conditioned uh, with the approval of the subdivision. Oh, when is that? Uh, that is the next uh, step in, in planning. Uh, once the zoning is approved, uh, the applicant will be required to apply for subdivision, and that, um, that subdivision will include a condition to construct that road. So that will under the applicant's responsibility okay. to do that road. Okay, correct. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. That's... Uh... Uh, any more questions? Any other questions from... Uh... Council members? Okay, so that concludes questions to administration. And at this time, I will ask if council members have any questions to the administration or to the applicant uh, or of the previous discussion related to any new information that might have arisen out of the previous discussion. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, just for the applicant, do you have the further uh, engagement plan uh, with residents around this area to communicate more information 
uh, in terms of this development. Uh, that's a question. So the engagement process happens uh, through rezoning, which we're, we're currently going through. So um, we've, we've kind of gone through the engagement process with the city. One of the questions that was asked earlier was um, why we want to get this rezoning approved now. Um, the reason is it's, it's difficult to, to uh, market and sell these sites if you don't know what you have to, uh, to sell and market. So we just need some clarity on, on the zoning so we can go to market. We do have a subdivision application underway. Our plan is to get that subdivision approved in Q1 of 2024. And um, working with the adjacent developer, um, build this site in, in 2024. So our goal is to advance this. It's, it's not, uh, not getting this approval so the site can, can sit around. Um, you know, going forward, we will um, address all of the subdivision conditions that, that come forward. And as I mentioned, that subdivision is currently in process. Uh, I understand it from process perspective. So my question is, do you have a specific plan and to address certain concerns? concerns and from residents around this area, which I I heard very clearly back to the summertime. I mean, if move forward, you still have that process in place. That means we can provide more information, have more communication with residents around this area to make sure they understand this development, what's impact to them and what you're doing to minimize the impact. So that's my question. Yes, I guess um, similar to the previous application, our preference would be those communications to go through the city of Edmonton at time of subdivision. So um, we've heard and, and city administrations have heard those concerns and they are being and will be addressed at time of subdivision. Okay, so that means there's more uh, engagement still underway. That would be through the city of Edmonton and admin, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you, Councillor Ray. So that concludes the questions on new information. At this time, we are ready to close the public hearing on uh, bylaws 313 and 314. So moved. Oh, I can close. Yeah, please, Councillor Rice, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll close the public hearing for this 3.13, 3 3.14. Okay, need a seconder, please. Second. Councillor Wright, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the first reading for 3.13, 3.14. Second. Thank you. Please vote. Oh, sorry. Somebody wants to speak. Yeah, anyone to speak? Okay, to speak. Seeing none to close, Councillor Rice. I, I do understand uh, the development and for Chapel neighborhoods uh, is really important. And also uh, we heard a different uh, voice regarding the development happening in Chapel specifically for this one and related to the North Sask Saskatchewan River Valley and the river system. Um, when I was uh, on site meeting in summertime and back to the summer, uh, residents around this area do have concerns and regarding uh, the traffic uh, congestions and specifically the uh, adjacent area still under development, still not finished yet. Um, even like east side, west side, and also the north side as well. Um, the big concern I heard, and there are two big concerns here, and one is about the street safety and for the kids. Uh, because most people move in those view neighborhood area, a younger family. There are many, many kids and uh, prey on the street uh, around 
as you can see on the map, I mean, these two block, and then there are lots of construction around there. That is one reason. A lot of reason in physics development is finished. This development is finished, and the housing traffic impact the neighborhood street and for our kids who play on the street. So that is a big concern I heard and from residents. Um, I know I heard today and we don't have uh, the specific detail plan for the extension of 28th Avenue. And because if that extension of 20, uh, 28th Avenue could be complete as soon as possible, that will reduce some traffic going through in the neighborhood, that it will reduce some concern and for the street safety. Uh, so I still want to continue work with um, our city uh, development team and also the developers to look at the opportunity, how we can find, identify the opportunity to really make that extension of 28th Avenue and in the timely way and it can reduce the pressure and for the community inside road traffic. Um, I know I, I, I do not want to stop the development because this development is important for our city to align our with our city plan. But I do think there's still few uh, area and we need to work together and listen and to the uh, residents around the area to make sure when we develop um, in certain sites and then to reduce any possible negative impact to the existing um, street and for the existing uh, housing um, or neighborhoods uh, around this development. So that is my intention. Yes, I'm going to um, make this um, rezoning approved today. Um, as I heard and from applicants, we need this first step and to move to the next step for the subdivision. Um, we cannot stop here, but I'm still looking forward to have more opportunity, more communication, and to really address the concerns we heard from residents around that area. So I just want to put that very clear um, for the purpose why, and today I support this resume and move forward. And hopefully for the next step, we can still engage the residents and then find an effective way to address the concern we heard there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Rice, do you want to move the second and third reading, please? I, I just muted. I move the second read for 3.13, 3.14. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the consideration of the street reading and a four. Three point one three, three point one four. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the last reading of street reading and for uh, bylaw, for bylaw 20684 and char bylaw uh, 20685. Second. Thank you, please vote.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Moving along, we are on to item 3.17, 3.18. Bylaw 20691 to amend the Cashman Neighborhood Area Structure Plan and Charter Bylaw 20692 to allow for medium rise multi unit housing Cashman exempted by Councillor Rice. And uh, okay, Councillor Rice, would you like a presentation from administration? Uh Yes, please. Okay, go ahead, please, to administration for a presentation. Good morning. This application proposes a rezoning from the DC-1 direct development control provision to the DC-1 and the ROA-8 zone to allow for medium-rise multi-unit housing with limited ground floor commercial uses. Amendments to the Cashman Neighborhood Area Structure Plan are also proposed to facilitate this rezoning. Next slide, please. The proposed ROA 8 site is located west of 103A Street and south of Ellisley Road. Site access is through Cashman Crescent, which connects to 103A Street. The site is surrounded by a stone pot in the, in the east, hotel, offices, and commercial buildings in the northeast, the Tony Cashman Park, and the Blackmore Ravine about the site in the south, west, and north. The subject site is within a five minutes walk to shared use paths and bus service along 103A. The site is also within walking distance of various amenities such as parks and other commercial developments. Next slide, please. As part of public engagement for this application, a rezoning information sign was installed on the site and notices were mailed to surrounding landowners and the Black Mud Creek Community League. Administration received three responses from surrounding landowners with concerns about traffic, loss of wildlife habitats and recreation area, as well as the inability to sell units due to noise from the Highway 2 corridor. Inquiries were also received from four landowners, including questions about building plans and the site's location. Next slide, please. While the uses in the RO8 zone are similar to the current DC-1 provision, the major difference between the existing DC-1 and the proposed RO8 zone are an increase in floor Asia ratio from 1.5 to 3.7 and an increase in the maximum height from 20 to 23 meters. If this proposal is approved, the RO8 zone will become the ROM H23 zone on January 1st, 2024 the uses and regulations of the ROM H23 zone are similar to those in the proposed ROA8 zone and will be compatible with the surrounding developments. Next slide, please. A transportation impact assessment was reviewed as part of the application. The assessment identified the need for traffic signals on the 103A streets at the two intersections of Cashman Crescent. This will be funded at the developer's expense. The assessment also reviewed the Ellisley Road corridor in the vicinity of the interchange with the QE2 highway, improvements to the west and south approaches of the 103A Street and Ellisley Road intersection will also be completed by the developer. These improvements are anticipated to improve the safety of the intersection but peak hour congestion is still anticipated to occur as a result of the high traffic demands in the area. Next slide, please. To facilitate the rezoning, the application proposes to redesignate the corresponding area of the rezoning site within the Cashman NASP from the mixed use residential commercial office to high density residential. The text within the plan will also be amended to support the redesignation and allow development of the subject sites through standard zones rather than development control provisions. The proposed development also aligns with the city plan by accommodating population growth within Edmonton's existing boundaries. Next slide, please. 
Administration recommends that the proposal be approved because it aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan and it is compatible with the surrounding and planned land uses. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And the folks registered in favor are to answer questions only. And at this time, I'll ask Councillor Rice if you have questions to the applicant. Uh, yes. Thank Go. you, Mayor Sophie. Just mm -hmm. give just give me thirty seconds so they can uh, uh, come up to the uh, to the through the microphones. All right, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. I do want to say uh, thank you, applicants and the city administration to put this rezoning application. Uh, it, it is important development uh, in that view neighborhood attachment area. Um, so my question will focus on the traffic concerns. And as everybody already knows, um, this side of development, this rezoning is just right beside 103 A Street. And for 103, one street link to the intersection with Allison Road, we call that T section and we call uh, the Battle Lake. And since I, I was become councillor, I received so many emails and from neighborhoods concerning the traffic uh, on that 103 A Street and specifically linked to the intersection as well. Uh, so my first question is about what is your specific plan and with this rezoning application to address that traffic concern because based on this development will add additional over 900 unions. That means assuming and will one over 1000 cars on that busy road already. Good morning. Through you, Mayor Sohi so to Councillor Rice. It's Catherine Olberg from Bunton Associates. I prepared the traffic impact assessment for the site. Um, we looked at the intersection, not just in terms of the, the proposed rezoning application, but also considered the build out of Cashman and Kavanaugh as well. Um, unfortunately, there is long term upgrading requirements along Ellerslie Road um, that would be a city responsibility as well as provincial uh, for the interchange. So in the interim, we did review um, collision data as well as updated traffic information to look at a short term, what we could do in the short term to alleviate some of the concerns that we're seeing at that location. So we had four recommendations within the report. One of them that the city has already undertaken in terms of coordinating the traffic signals between 101 Street and 103 A Street. So there's four signals. They are closely spaced intersections. Um, but the city has been working with the province to coordinate the signals along that corridor to improve flow through the interchange. Uh, we also identified some spot improvements uh, to at 103 A Street and Ellerslie Road that the city mentioned. And these were to address current lane imbalances, the lane that people want to be in when they're turning at the intersection versus where they want to end up. So there's a lot of cutting lanes and things like that. So we've tried to address that through the implementation of global uh, right turns northbound um, and also a safety concern with some left turn movements identified a channelizing island. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And at the southbound ramp intersection, we've also identified a potential change to the geometry there to address some rear end collision um, and lane balance concerns that we identified. So they're all short term improvements um, proposed to be handled again, they will benefit the broader Heritage Valley area, not just the site. So we did the work on behalf of the site, but we are hoping to improve some of the safety concerns we saw on the broader scale. Oh, okay, so thank you for that. What I heard is, and then with this, uh, we only approve and because add additional traffic, and then the short term improvement will be in place. And I already signed in the uh, slide, one slide, and the city ad administration provided and for the short term improvement. So, what is specific timeline for that uh, improvement? Will it be before the construction for the site construction started or the after? 
No, there's still some work to be done. So design work would need to be done. And it is something that benefits the entire basin. So the, the uh, city and the applicant will work with other developers in the area to have it included in the arterial road assessment bylaw. Um, again, it's not simply because of this site, it is growth within Southwest Edmonton. So there's a couple of steps that need to happen. It won't necessarily be in place prior to this particular site developing, um, but it will be included in the, or we're hoping to include it in the arterial road bylaw so that it can be dealt with in the short term. Uh, so that be like three years, two years, do you have a specific timeline? No timeline associated with it. So no time in that. And also for this site development, do you have specific time now when this site development for the construction work will be finished? I will pass that on to one of the people in person. Hi, I'm Michaela Davis with Melcor. Um, the site, we intend to develop the site in 2024. Um, and I think that there are some traffic uh, improvement initiatives that we would do at that time as it pertains to the specific site, so along 103A. Um, but the intent would be to develop the sites in 2024. Okay, uh, thank you, that's my question. Thank so you. I will have a question to administration. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Sure, I have the chair. Thank you. Yeah, that corner of Ellesley Road and 103rd A Street is pretty, con it's very confusing uh, uh, for, for motorists and also pose a, Safety risk for pedestrians and uh, and uh, and and cyclists uh, and people using other more sustainable modes of transportation. So, if I hear correctly, Catherine, that is work that province in in uh, working alongside city is going to undertake as part of Highway Two upgrades. Yes, any any work on the interchange would require provincial um, co coordination. Um, yeah, so that that's something that the city is working with the province on in terms of the signal timing improvements and any long-term improvements would need to be a partnership with the province. Oh, I see. And you don't know the, uh, the uh, you have any, any insights in that one, what, what the mm -hmm. timelines, or maybe <laughs> ask, ask that to administration. Okay, got it. Because I, I, you know that those concerns are re real and that, uh, and good thing that we are seeing a lot of commercial development around that corridor, which is very good for a, for for a, uh, you know, tax base of the city. But it does add to the a lot of pressures because of that, uh, uh, you know, not having proper kind of alignment on the on the roadway. Right. Good. Okay. Thank you. We'll ask that to administration. All right. With that, I will take the chair back. Chair returned. Uh, I will. At this time, we'll go to administration for questions. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sophie. Um, I want to ask about the long term um, for that T section, and also we mentioned about the interchange because that's linked to the Cargo Trail and Highway 2. Um, for that long term upgrade and to resolve this traffic issue because that is a real big issue and then specific in the winter time. And um, some uh, constituent told me, and for that short distance and the link to uh, the Highway 2 and the link to Alice Road and only like 500 meters, like 600 meters, and it takes us 20 to 30 minutes. So what is city's specific plan and related to this site development? Because this is what, Add additional 100, at least 100 cars, and in that busy traffic already. So I want to get some information on that. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> I'll answer first. Uh, so I think uh, your first part of the question was related to uh, the interchange improvements, uh, long-term improvements, uh, as mentioned by Ms. Oberg. Uh, uh, it is uh, going to be first and foremost. We need to uh, figure out what that interchange improvement looks like. Currently, province is uh, working on a regional network study that does include this corridor. So we are expecting some outcomes uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the interchange improvements. End of the day, uh, given that this uh, the congestion is primarily related to city traffic, uh, um, we can look into partnership with the province, but uh, um, typically, uh, 
city uh, will require to find funding to do any upgrades. Uh, second part of the question in terms of uh, what happens with this development. Uh, so this development was uh, all, again, already contemplated as part of the NSP approval. And what we have done more recently is revisited uh, uh, the entire corridor, uh, some of the significant intersections with latest data, and uh, uh, to verify uh, what the uh, uh, 103A Street currently carries and what was con contemplated. Uh, answer to that is uh, 103A uh, Street is already constructed as a four-lane roadway, which, uh, uh, which carries 20,000 plus minus traffic, and that is uh, more than enough capacity to uh, handle any uh, remaining development, both in Cashman and Kavanaugh area. Uh, can you show me that uh, slide and with some like blue line and in that slide specific? Uh, because I did see that slide and in the attachment um, in the presentation here. Uh, maybe I can uh, request clerk to bring uh, slide five. Um, I understand for the long term that we do have some uh, plan in place. Um, in terms of widening Alice Road, is that, or is that also the part of this plan as well? Or is that the separate plan for the widening that uh, Alice Road in that uh, adjacent to the T-section? So widening of Ellersley is also long-term, part of the long-term uh, improvements uh, that uh, could be done in conjunction with uh, uh, the interchange improvements. Okay, so that's his long term. And then in terms of this green lines, this is a, it's my understanding is a, is a scope of developers will make sure the short term improvement and for this intersection. Is that correct? That's correct. And this will primarily address some of the safety concerns at this intersection. So address this traffic flow and reduce the time, waiting time, and also address some like the safety concerns and during this intersection. So this, what I heard from Apple Kent and the construction for the site will start 2024. So hopefully they will have a quarterly timeline and to make this improvement. So is that understanding correct? So as applicant mentioned, uh, the signalization along 103A Street, um, that is um, going to be part of the subdivision approval and then the applicant will be seeking uh, uh, ARA bylaw uh, to uh, incorporate any changes at Ellersley Road. So short answer, yes. Okay, thank you very much. I want to be that in the public record. And also for the green spaces, I have one very quick question. And because this RA, uh, RA8, and is really close, the development is really close ribbon system, is that Brockmart Creek? A ribbon system. And is there any specific concerns there or is there any specific productive overlay to protect our green spaces? Thank you for that question, Councillor. Uh, to protect the ravine system, the rezoning area abuts uh, a parcel that is currently zoned AP. So the, AP, the purpose of the AP zone next to the ravine system is to provide that protection for the ravine system. No, the current is a DC one to RA eight. I didn't say AP. Sorry. So sorry, uh, sorry, yeah. Mr. Mayor, my time is out. Yeah. You want no. me to come back? Yeah, please do. Uh, unless there's a quick answer to that question. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mayor. Sorry, I'll give a quick answer. The the area adjacent to the creek is already zoned AP. It was taken at an earlier time, uh, Councillor Rice. So that has already been protected. And the lands uh, below the topper bank in the creek is zoned A, which is already protected. They were done upon previous subdivision, uh, sorry, previous rezonings. So the top of yeah. bank is already done, right? Correct. And then, and then I walk there, and there are lots of things. That is a protection and for the uh, green space of ribbon system. Is that right? Sorry, if I understood your question. I, th correctly. I think let's let's do a second round then, Councillor Rice. Because okay, I, sure. I six, yeah. I'll move a second round. Okay, thank second. you, Councillor Nack. Second. Please vote. Was was, was second by Councillor Wright.
Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Hamilton. Sorry, votes. it's not showing up for me. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Yes, specifically for the green spaces, and then infosys is only approved. Um, like we talk about uh, the top of bank and already complete. So that is the production, and then for the green spaces, right? Yes, Councillor Rice, those uh, those approvals were already done and taken into consideration when the neighbourhood was first planned. And then when this area was initially uh, rezoned, uh, which was to the DC1, uh, we, we took more of an upland setback, more or less to push the buildings further back from the creek. Uh, it was done at some concerns at the time from adjacent residents across the creek in Black Mud Creek, and it provided a greater separation distance. So those were, were taken into account then. Uh, this doesn't alter that line and just continues that, uh, that pattern of growth. Uh, because this area is a, com a combination most right now and is a commercial use area, and is there any like environment assessment requirements needed for this type of rezoning and to protect the ribbon system? Uh, no, there isn't, Council. Those, again, were already done as part of the initial planning phases, which were when the area was first rezoned. So we don't need that and for this change, for this rezoning? That's correct. We don't need it now, no. No. So because that it's, it, it was done at the beginning and then to make sure that production and for the green spaces is, is already there. That's correct. And we're just carrying those protections on into this zoning, yes. Okay, so that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank, you my time. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. At this time, I will ask if uh, any council members have any questions to administration or to the applicant. Uh, uh, on uh, any new information arising out of the previous discussion. Seeing none, we're ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. So I'm happy to close it. Go ahead, please. So I'd like to close uh, 7.17, 7 oh, 3.17, 3.18. Thank you. Need a seconder? Second. Councillor Principe? Right, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the first reading for the 3.17, 3.18. Second. Thank you. We have a first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Uh, Councillor Rice to close. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. It will be very quick. And I support this development. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, so my question the biggest concern is about the traffic. Uh, I understand right now the actions and from long term to at to upgrade that intersection, also to upgrade the interchange and on um, Alice Road's link to the Highway 2 and the Tiger Trail, and also 103A Street, that is actually is a major street and for the neighborhood around that area, and then including like Collingham, like uh, Allard, and the Kavanaugh and the Cashman neighborhoods. Uh, so that that'll be very good news and to see it as long-term and already uh, in the way and for us to address that uh, traffic issue that is all the constituents want to see as well. Um, <clears throat> from short term, I, I appreciate the responsibility the applicants uh, taking and to address these traffic concerns and in the short term. Like, like we heard earlier, it's not about this private development, will be benefited for the broader Heritage Valley area. And the specific, this area is a combination of, of commercial use that support lots of our city's business and also local economy and growth and recovery as well. And also hope uh, this development will bring 
um, more people and to the neighborhoods and also bring some vibrancy and to that commercial area. Uh, we already uh, use the lots and then serve the Edmontonians lots as well. So I'm going to support this development, but I do want to say uh, as a ward councillor for this area, this traffic issue is really important to my constituents, also important to me as well. I will continue uh, to push this. And also I will continue to work uh, with applicants and developers and also work with our city's development team and really address this traffic concerns. And I, since I become counselor, I already heard for two years already. And I believe this winter when so coming and the email will continue coming to my inbox. So I look forward, forward to work together to address this concern and for our residents. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move second grade for 3.17, 3.18. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the consideration for the third read of bylaw 2000, oh, sorry, bylaw 20691 and chart bylaw 20692. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. I move the final reading of, of three readings and for the bylaw 20691 and the chart bylaw 20692. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we are moving along. Next item is 3.22. Uh, Charter bylaw 20687 to allow for medium rise multi unit housing, Prince Rupert. Selected by Councillor Piquet, right? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll go. To, you need a presentation from administration, Councillor Piquet? Uh, you know, we can skip the presentation. I just have questions. Okay. Unless anyone else wants it, I don't want to. Councillor, I think uh, with this item as a non support, it would be beneficial to uh, have the presentation. Okay, sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good. All right, administration will get a presentation. Yes, good morning. Uh, this application proposes a rezoning from an outdated DC2 site specific development control provision to the RA8 medium rise apartment zone. On January 1st, 2024, the RA8 zone would become the RMH23 medium scale residential zone under the new zoning bylaw, and it is under this zone that future development would occur. As such, this presentation will focus on the RM zone which allows for a mid-rise residential building with limited commercial opportunities at ground level and a height of up to 23 meters or approximately six stories. Next slide, please. The site is located in the center of the Prince Rupert neighborhood within a large existing pocket of zoning allowing for low-rise multi-unit housing under the RA7 low-rise apartment zone and across from open space. Bus service is available to the south on 111th Avenue and to the north on Kingsway approximately 250 and 500 meter walking distance respectively. Next slide, please. During engagement, administra administration spoke with five people, most of whom asked questions but did not state any kind of position. Of the two who did take a position, one was in favor and one was opposed. 
concerns heard relative to the location of the proposal on the interior of the community, non-conformance with the city plan, sufficient parking, and its fit within the character of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. City plan directs more intense forms of development to a network of nodes and corridors. This site is outside of this network and administration does not consider it to be in a transition area or an edge condition from a node or corridor. Next slide, please. The city plan does provide direction that some mid-rise could be found in local nodes, however, their specific locations are not identified. The city plan describes local nodes as being small activity centers that are a community focal point for businesses, services, gathering, and housing. They are integrated with their neighborhood and feature strong pedestrian and cycling linkages and transit. Next slide, please. In reviewing this application, we weighed the local node description from the city plan against the surrounding conditions of the location. There is a small commercial strip nearby, but there is not a significant volume or variety of businesses. The adjacent open space offers some animation through a playground, but lacks more element elements like a school, community league building, or sports field. Also, more transit and cycling connections are needed to link the interior of the neighborhood to surrounding corridors and shared pathways. While the city plan expect, expects local nodes to emerge and flourish as neighborhoods change over time, our interpretation is that the elements or activity centers need to exist before mid-rise is considered. Next slide, please. While this application is not supportable based on our interpretation of existing policy, we want to highlight that the proposed zone is generally compatible in this location. The RMH23 zone essentially allows for an additional two stories, and given the site context directly across from open space, and surrounded by four-story zoning, this is a compatible form of development. If approved, it is not anticipated to create a large negative impacts on surrounding properties. Next slide, please. In summary, it is recognized that additional impacts created by the proposed zone are minimal. However, the city plan encourages making intentional choices to allow more intense development within the nodes and corridors network. A mid-rise building in this location is outside of nodes and corridors, and therefore interpreted to be misaligned with the city plan and is not supported at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll go to folks in favor. Allison Rossland, Situate Inc., joining remotely. Allison, are you there? Jeff Booth, Situate Inc., joining remotely. Yes, I'm here. Um, Allison has a presentation to give before mine. My apologies, I was muted. Sorry there you about are. that. Got it, there you are. Uh, Sibitin Panju, to answer questions only. Are you yes, there? I'm here. Okay, as well as uh, in Sihan, in Sihan Panju joining us to make a presentation. Yes, I'm here as well. All right, thank you. All right, we will start with Alison Rosland. Good morning, members of council. My name is Alison Rosland from Situate, and I'm speaking this morning about our client Pragma Incorporated's application to rezone their property in Prince Rupert from a direct control zone that allows for apartment housing of up to four stories to the RA8 zone to allow for a new apartment building of up to six stories. We've applied to rezone the site from its current direct control zone because it was written in 1984. At nearly 40 years old, the zone is very outdated relative to our contemporary regulatory framework. Next slide. In August of this year, Situate submitted the application and at the same time we created a dedicated web page to provide information and updates about the project. Next slide. In September, we also mailed an information letter to 191 nearby neighbors to let them know about the project, the web page, and to let them know who we are and how to reach us. We also posted a sign on the site with our contact info and the web page URL. We heard from one neighbor who was opposed to the rezoning, but they did not respond when we emailed them back to ask their reasons for opposition. We also contacted the Community League who stated they believe mid-rise buildings should not be located in the interior of the neighborhood. City administration also received one response in opposition as stated in their report to council. 
Administration has taken a position of non-support for the proposed rezoning and suggested that low-rise development would be more appropriate than a mid-rise building on this site. I will explain why we believe that mid-rise is appropriate in this location in the remainder of my presentation. Next slide. The site is under consideration is quite large by infill standards. It has an area of about 1,835 square meters, which is the size of about four typical single detached lots. The site abuts 116th Street and is directly across from the Prince Rupert Playground and Park, which is very large at over two hectares. The buildings surrounding the site are low-rise apartments. The site is near many commercial and business industrial amenities to the west of the site between 119th Street and 121st Street. There is also a large commercial area to the north of the site on Kingsway with Kingsway Mall approximately 970 metres east of the site. The site is also near Orway Park and St. Catherine Catholic School. There are several bus stops nearby on 111th Avenue, 109th Street and Kingsway, which are arterial roads and frequent bus routes. The site is located about 1.1 kilometers from the Nate LRT stop and is located near a bike route along 121st Street. The teal gradients show the primary corridors that surround the Prince Rupert neighborhood. My colleague, Jeff Booth, will speak more about that in his presentation in just a moment. Next slide. As you can see on this slide, the site is surrounded by RA7 zoned properties with existing low-rise apartment buildings. The RA7 zone allows development of up to four stories. Apart from the maximum height, the regulations of the RA7 and RA8 zones are largely the same. The RA7 zone properties around the site will provide an, approximate trend, an appropriate transition from the proposed six-story development to the lower density buildings surrounding this area. Next slide. This slide shows some of the existing apartment buildings on the same block as the subject site. The two buildings on the left are immediately adjacent to the site. Next slide. So before I wrap up, I'm going to show a couple of graphs. This first one provides an overview of the population in Prince Rupert from 1971 to 2019 compared to the overall population in Edmonton. You can see that the neighborhood population has decreased by over 800 people or almost 40%. By contrast, the population of Edmonton has increased substantially over that same time frame. A six-story multi-unit building on this site will help bring people back to Prince Rupert in a location where people can easily access shops, services, amenities, and transit. Next slide. And on my last slide, you can see the breakdown of the housing mix in the neighborhood. Single detached houses make up 55% of the mix, while there are no mid-rise buildings in the neighborhood at all. The proposed rezoning will also help provide a more balanced mix of housing in the neighborhood, which is incredibly important at a time when Edmonton, like many other Canadian cities, is experiencing a shortage of housing. Next slide. With that, I will wrap up and hand it over to my colleague Jeff, who's going to speak in more detail about why the proposed rezoning, pardon me, the proposed zoning worked particularly well on this site. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Jeff Booth. Uh, good morning. Hello, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. My name is Jeff Booth from Situate, and I'll be speaking a bit more about the proposed rezoning and why we believe it's appropriate for the subject site due to its alignment with city plan, compatibility with surrounding development, and similarity to past rezonings. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning aligns with city plan policy that encourages 50% of new housing units being added through infill citywide by supporting residential infill at a variety of scales, densities, and designs within all parts of our residential neighborhoods. Administration's main reason for not supporting the rezoning is that they believe the site is too far from any nodes and corridors. Next slide. However, the site is approximately two blocks from 111th Avenue, which is a primary corridor. Mid and high rise buildings up to 20 stories in height are encouraged within primary corridors. City plan states that primary corridors are three to five blocks wide, which means that the site should be considered to be within this corridor under current policy direction, as shown through the gradient on this map. In addition, Kingsway to the north is also a primary corridor, which we've marked with a teal gradient on this map. We're showing this to illustrate the fact that the site is in fact on the edge of one primary corridor and very close to another. Next slide. 
Next, I'll speak to the proposed rezoning's compatibility with surrounding development and why a new six-story building will have negligible impacts on surrounding buildings. As Allison mentioned, the subject site is surrounded by RA7 zone properties and is located across the street from a large park. This area is already a multi-unit housing node within the neighborhood, and our application will add more of that housing form and provide much needed homes within our city. Next slide. In addition, as part of our application, we submitted a, a sun shadow study based on the largest building that could be built under the proposed rezoning. The sun shadow study shows that for most of the year, the shadow impact is fairly limited and the shadow moves quite rapidly over the ground throughout the day, such that no yard would be in permanent or perpetual shadow. Next slide. This slide shows when the surrounding buildings were constructed, with the oldest being built in 1953 and the average age being 57. These buildings are nearing the end of their life cycles and are likely to be redeveloped with more stories in the near future. Next slide. Another reason that we believe RA8 is appropriate for this site is that this application is very similar to other rezonings that administration has supported and that were approved by the city council in the past. This slide shows one example. At the May 12, 2020 public hearing, 11009109A Ave was rezoned from RA7 to a DC2 provision to allow for a residential development with a maximum height of 28 meters in the neighborhood of Queen Mary Park. This is five meters taller than the maximum height of the RA8 zone. Similar to our proposed rezoning, the 109A Ave property is located in the interior of the neighborhood on a local road. Also similar to our proposal, the property is located next to a park and the properties to the south are zoned RA7. However, unlike our proposal, which is surrounded by RA7 zone properties, the 109A Ave property is located across the street from small scale development and properties zoned RF4 and RF1. Next slide. The administration report for the Queen Mary Park rezoning states that while the site is internal to the neighborhood and located on a local road, the site is mostly surrounded by low rise apartments, which creates an appropriate transition for the proposed eight story building. We believe that this same rationale should apply to the subject site. Administration's report for our rezoning also acknowledges that the proposed development is compatible with surrounding zoning and would have no negative impact on surrounding properties. Administration's rationale for non-support, that the site is too far from a corridor, also brings up an issue of equity. We've heard from councillors at recent public hearings that the planning practice of only allowing multi-unit housing at the edges of neighbourhoods along busy roadways is inequitable and undesirable. The site's location across the street from a park in the interior of a neighbourhood where there are already numerous apartment buildings provides a great alternative to the practice of making multi-unit housing act as a buffer along arterial roads. Next slide. So to wrap up, I would like to respectfully ask for council's support today on the rezoning application, and in particular for your support for an application that will have essentially no impact on surrounding development, will bring people back to a neighborhood that has lost almost 40% of its population over the last few decades, and is located a stone's throw from primary corridors and a major node and will provide housing in a time of need. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. We will uh, stop here, take uh, a break, and we will be back at 1.30, and we will start with uh, uh, Sibitain Panju, but uh, to answer questions, but he's only to answer questions only, but then we'll go to uh, NCA Panju after when we come back at 1.30, okay? Until then, we are on the recess.
council chambers. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I would like to call this meeting back to order and we'll do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Councillor Jan. Okay. All right. We were uh, having a pres having presentations from folks in favor of uh, item number three point two two. We heard from Jeff Booth. Next, uh, Subtain Panju is to answer questions only, and we will move on to uh, Insia Panju to make a presentation. Please go ahead. Hello and good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Insia Panju from Pragma Incorporated, the company that will be developing the site being considered for rezoning today. Thank you for taking the time to hear my presentation and consider the application. To give you a bit of background on our company, we've been in business since 2020. We acquire, renovate, and develop multi-residential properties to provide nice spaces for people to live. The, bu the building that currently sits on the site was built in 1965 and is nearing the end of its life cycle. We are passionate about providing housing in housing options in walkable spaces and transit-oriented communities throughout Edmonton. Next slide, please. We believe the community of Prince Rupert is a perfect spot for our project as it's located close to transit and amenities. The site is close to the Metro LRT line and 111th Avenue has frequent bus, bus service, which allow both residents to, get, to easily get around the city. The site is also located close to parks and green spaces, schools and commercial services. Providing more housing options in the community will help support the businesses and schools in the area and contribute to the community's vibrancy. We're looking to attract a mix of Edmontonians that want to live in a well-connected location. Next slide, please. I'm also excited to be a part of this next era of city rebuilding in Edmonton. The goals set out in the city plan are providing opportunities to build different housing types that will give families more options to live in great neighborhoods like Peter Rupert. We want to be part of that process and provide housing that is designed well and built well in Edmonton's neighborhoods. Next slide, please. As I finish up my presentation, I would like to end by saying that I'm happy to be here today and speak about this project. I'm hopeful that with your support, we can build something great on this site in Prince Rupert that provides new housing options for the community and helps implement the city plan's goals. Thank you for your time today to listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, now we will open uh, uh, to questions from council members. Let's see. Councillor Paquette, you exempted this. Would you, you have any questions to uh, folks in favor? Well, go ahead, please. No, just for administration. Just for administration. Maybe I'll start, uh, uh, I'll pass on the chair to Councillor Rutherford. So taken. Yeah, maybe e e to either one of you, uh, uh, can you walk me through again why 
administration is not in support of this uh, application and uh, why do you think it should be supported? I know you made some points. So just first, let's start with why. How does not fit this fit into the city plan? Sure. So administration, administration has taken the position that this site is too far from any nodes or corridors. Um, our interpretation of city plan is that this can be considered to be within the 111th Avenue corridor. City plan says that primary corridors are three to five blocks wide. So that range could include this site. Um, in addition, the site is surrounded by RA7 zone properties. So it'll be more multi-unit housing in an area that already has a lot of multi-unit housing. So it'll be compatible with with the surrounding development. Okay. So the city plan says five blocks either side of a primary corridor and the, the district planning work is underway now uh, and 111 is a primary corridor. You still think two blocks away from 111th fits into that plan? I believe so, yes. Okay. So I, is that the only objection from administration on this? I believe that was the main reason for non-support. Um, yeah, got it. Yeah, okay. they also said that the interior of the neighborhood does not meet the criteria for a local node. Yeah. So uh, essentially their position is it's not in a node or a corridor. Okay. And from a servicing perspective, uh, this low dense, uh, uh, low, low high rise now, and uh, how high you want to go, and uh, would the servicing be able to support it? Yes, uh, the city has reviewed all of the servicing, and there are no issues there. Uh, the building would be six stories high. The surrounding zoning, um, they're all zoned RA seven, which allows for four stories. Okay, so current zoning allows four stories, so you're going from four to six. Right. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Right. And I will, I will take the chair back and go to Councilor Wright. Returned. Hi, thank you. So with the new zoning bylaw um, renewal, if it stays as a DC2, it, or if, it, if we don't approve this and stays as a DC2, it just stays as a DC2, right? It doesn't flip That's it. Right. Okay, so that kind of restricts as far as um, providing more options for, for development, like as far as putting in some commercial to help develop the area? Yes, uh, uh, the current DC2 zoning has a pretty low maximum density, larger setbacks than we see in the even the current standard zones, let alone the ones that will be coming into effect in January. Okay, yeah, because I'm reading in the report one of the um, concerns is that it's not considered um, it's not considered to be a local node at this time, but perhaps by... Yeah, so there is that commercial strip mall around the corner, so with more people in the neighborhood, that uh, strip mall could flourish and the area could develop into a local node. Okay, so this would help create it. So it's like, kind of like the chicken or the egg, right? So do you put this in now to create that node or wait for some other development to create it? Right. Okay. Um, and then there was also concern about um, schools and community leagues buildings. Yeah, so um, administration's position is that it doesn't meet the criteria for a local node right now because there's no school on that park site across the street. Um, but regardless of whether this is a local node now or not, under Current city plan policy, the site could be considered to be within that 111th Ave primary corridor. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think there's lots of areas in the city that don't have those schools or don't have those community league buildings as well. So maybe okay. maybe this will help to invigorate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wright. All right. So that concludes the questions to uh, folks in favor of the application. And now we will go to questions of administration. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it is unusual uh, to see non-support 
and uh, you did give your rationale, but we also heard from the proponent. So I guess my question is, uh, you know, rather than just the binary support, non-support, if you were to look at it as a spectrum, where along that spectrum would uh, administration's position lie? Thanks for the question, Councillor. I think that uh, in this case, we're looking at a difference of interpretation. We respect the applicant's interpretation. Uh, the city plan is a, a fairly high level document. Um, our read uh, happens to be different than theirs. We see primary corridors, well, it's referenced to be three to five blocks wide. Um, it does specifically say one to two blocks on either side of the street. We see this is outside of that. Um, we also look at this site and it's on the very interior of the neighborhood. Um, I don't think it's uh, intent of the city plan to suggest that most of Prince Rupert is within primary corridors and therefore should see mid-rise and high-rise buildings. So our recommendation is really based on trying to uphold the nodes and corridors strategy in the city plan, uh, which is the policy that we reviewed this with respect to. In terms of where it is in that spectrum, that's a little bit hard to, to say. Um, we like to uh, uphold the policies that council um, passes and that's our interpretation today. Okay, so I understand uh, where you're coming from. I, what I'm inferring is that there's also a uh, concern that there's a risk that um, if you allow this, then that's pr setting precedent and then you must allow uh, further development in the same vein. Uh, this was, a, I believe, an argument made uh, for the community of um, Oliver many years ago. And that actually it ended up being a little bit prophetic. So response to that. Councillors, Jamie Johnson here. Just uh, we often hear this conversation. Um, we don't really treat these as having precedential value. And, and when you use the word must, I get a little nervous. What you will see, though, is future applicants right. will look Me to too. this. Future applicants will look to this for guidance, though. But it isn't. It doesn't require an obligation to to pass um, very similar applications in the future or pass this because there may have been similar ones in the past. On paper and according to the letter of the law. There, there may, this may create encouragement for similar applications. It doesn't require them. Council, just yeah. to add here, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Travis here. Uh, we're living in a fairly dynamic policy environment right now. Uh, yes, we have the city plan and obviously district plans are, are being undertaken right now. Um, however, as Andrew said, Mr. McClellan, uh, this is the, the interpretation of, of the city plan at the time of writing in terms of being fairly directive uh, to, to have that density on the nodes and corridors. Um, and further, our analysis uh, shows that, yeah, they, there, there won't be that much of an impact uh, with the additional two stories. Uh, so there's definitely pros and cons to this application. And in terms of that, that spectrum of, you know, support, non-support in that binary, like there's definitely times when there's a hard, we'll call it hard non-support where there um, is a number of factors that are lined up against it. Um, and this one is probably more along those 60, 40 lines in terms of, uh, as mentioned, it was an interpretation uh, of administration that uh, at the time to, to achieve city plan, um, our interpretation was that most of the higher density development should be directed towards those nodes and corridors. Um, and this may be an opportunity here that we see uh, where there isn't uh, that additional impact that it, that it may, may fit. Okay, yeah, no, I understand. Um, and then I guess that leads me to the question, that with the passing of the city plan, um, you know, as far as uh, local amenities um, and with the passing of the ZBR, uh, that opens the door for potential more amenities in the area. So it's, it's what I'm hearing is that this is sort of a, uh, um, it could go either way and council should take into account uh, the non-support from administration, but also um, there are other factors to consider. Is that, am I hearing that right? Correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much for the, the discussion um, so far. And I think I think what I'm really hearing is that this is a question of sequencing. So I, I think in the presentation I heard, um, you know, the conditions for local nodes need to be present before, before mid-rise is, um, is permitted. And I think that's a bit of a tension with, with city plans. So I think, you know, as was mentioned, you know, it talks about there being numerous existing local nodes 
and also great potential for the development of future areas. Um, they're expected to emerge and flourish as neighborhoods change over time. So is it, am I capturing that correctly, that this is a bit of a sequencing issue? Um, so if that commercial site, let's say, had come forward for a re redevelopment or rezoning for, for mixed use, four-story mixed use, for example, um, would, would that have sort of fit at that point with a local node approach? Yes, Council, I think that's a good way to put it in terms of the sequencing. Um, I think when we read the city plan, um, we see that, the, and the mid-rise specifically, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's no question that something like a low-rise development would fit within uh, a local node or even an emerging local node. Uh, I think our interpretation is that you have to be a little bit more cautious with that mid-rise form. Um, you know, mid-rise building is something we typically consider between five and eight stories. Um, and the secondary corridors in the city plan have low rises on them. So if we're gonna have mid rises outside of the identified nodes and corridors network, we just need to be cautious about that. And so when we talk about local nodes, uh, we would like to see in our interpretation, um, more of those activity type um, things present before mm -hmm. we consider that jump from low rise to mid rise. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I follow the logic of that. I think um, just just to confirm my understanding as well, so, so the draft uh, district policy uh, does support mid-rise along collector roads um, when they're at local nodes, uh, specifically where site size and context allow for appropriate transition to surrounding development. So I also want to confirm my understanding, 116th Street is a collector road? That's correct. Okay. So, so again, if this, if we were to go to the future, the commercial site had been redeveloped to, to mixed use, four story, this would be much more of a slam dunk just in terms of it fitting with, with those specific criteria? I, th I think there's various opportunities for more activity here. So, you know, if there's um, some mixed use zones, some neighborhood commercial or uh, neighborhood mixed use zone, there's also the open space that has a lot of potential as well. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, there used to be a school here uh, that's no longer there, um, but there's efforts in place to have uh, a community league building at some point in the future. Um, so some there's various ways that this could uh, emerge to be a more mm -hmm. fulsome local node. Uh, we just see mid-rise as being the thing that should follow on that front. Yeah, and I think, you know, m my time hasn't started, but uh, I'll, I'll maybe just save, save some comments for speaking, but I think that, that answers the, the technical questions that I had around that, so happy to speak to this at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Constable Stevenson. Constable Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. I, I think the only other question I'll have is, I guess I, and maybe maybe you did answer it, but maybe I haven't heard it quite clearly yet, so I'll just dig in, which is, so appreciate mid-rise, you're suggesting there's some other factors that you might want to see before that normally. Um, I'm also not hearing, and I, I just want to make sure I'm clear, that, um, you know, a local node can be interior to the community and can have you know, so whether it's low rise and, and some mid rise, so it's not like there, every community could have that potential depending on the design, depending on some characteristics. I mean, there are many communities that already have this, including this one where there's low rise around. So we're not suggesting that the city plan would, would somehow not support multi-unit buildings like this interior to a community, correct? Uh, that's correct, Councillor. I think uh, at places where there are clearly local nodes, there's opportunities within the city plan for a mid-rise building. And I guess, and maybe that's a debate for another day of, of what, what we mean by clearly a local node, because I, I would envision being across from a major park site, being across from a school, that that would also look like a local node to me, but, but um, Anyway, maybe that's a future debate. So I'll, I'll get into that. We'll, we'll have that conversation at a later time then. Um, so then the, the only other piece, again, I just wanting to understand is that this is a mid-rise proposal in a, in a fairly large partial of land zone for low rise. And, and so, and again, yet yeah, the concern is, is primarily waiting for that commercial. So, so even though this is surrounded by low rise, therefore your your impact that you would see is is fairly minimal to the uh, neighboring properties, you're putting more weight on the commercial piece than you are the contextual part of this area. Is that right? 
I think that's fair, Council. We're, we're taking a, a very strong reliance on a policy approach to our recommendation here. Uh, we fully admit that the addition of two more stories uh, on a site like this with the surrounding existing zoning is probably not going to create, uh, you know, big compatibility problems or anything like that. Uh, you know, this is our attempt to, to support the nodes and corridors approach in the city plan. And, and it's not just commercial that would need to come first. There's lots of other things. Um, you know, a good example of um, a local node, uh, and we do have one on slide nine of the presentation if the clerk wants to bring it up, uh, is in Hazeldean on um, 96th Street and 66th Avenue. There's a wide variety of commercial there uh, from bars yeah. to daycares. There's a playground, a spray park, a community league building, a school. There's transit through the site. There's active nodes, active uh, pathways through there. So that's sort of what we are seeing should develop as a local node prior to going up to that uh, mid-rise um, jump. That, that's and really I, what it comes down to relative to the yeah. policy side. But in terms of the actual compatibility of the zone with the surrounding context, we don't really have any concerns. Okay. And then there's, I imagine, a bit of a chicken and egg conversation, though, because can you sustain that without the people to sustain it? Can, yeah. can, can those things form if they don't have a large enough population? You know, is there a reason why almost every mature neighborhood built in the 1950s and 60s no longer has a vibrant local corner shop like this? And is it primarily driven by population right now? Yeah, and then I do understand that argument. And that's where I think in this specific location in Prince Rupert, we do have this very large um, pocket of RA7 zoning, um, yeah. which, you know, as was brought up by the applicant, there's a lot of buildings there that might get redeveloped. You know, our estimation is you could probably get 800 to 900 new dwellings in there under the existing four-story uh, low-rise zoning. So there's still lots of opportunity to, to have a lot of increase in residential density here without necessarily having to deviate from the nodes and corridors approach in, in our interpretation. That's helpful. No, I appreciate that. That's great. Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Yes, just, I have yeah, just to want to follow up on those line of question because when you look at the the whole block between 113 Avenue, 112 Avenue, 116 and 117 Street, it is unique because right, it's surrounded by single family, but this is not single family, right? So, uh, uh, if it were to be single family, what would be allowed under the zoning regula uh, 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 regulation that we recently approved that come into effect January 1st? If the zoning was like the RS zone? Yeah, if it was single family zone. So, so yeah, if, if the, under the single family zone, under the new zoning value, you're essentially gonna get that row housing or small apartments, about three yeah, stories. Yeah, three story. Um, okay. Depending on whether it's corners or mid blocks the, and the site size, but mm -hmm. essentially the max would be like a three story Got it. Uh, small apartment. Yeah, so recognize the uniqueness of the entire block. Has there been, I know, the ownership in these kind of situations fragmented. Uh, Re kind of reimagining the entire block in a in a different way, right? Uh, has that has that thought occurred? Uh, reimagining this though, the the, the entire part. block, recognizing that it's it's low, it's a it's not single family, right? right. It is uh, uh, low rise, not going to mid rise. Uh, but the application having, we have is is obviously for just the one site. Um, yeah. You know, when we look at the policy and the city plan, you know, from a high level, we look at the RA7 zoning as kind of being what should be there going forward mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, a place in the center of a neighborhood. And there's lots of opportunities that are available within that existing zoning if some of those sites were to get redeveloped. It, you know, compared to a lot of RA7 areas, this, these buildings are actually quite small and very spread out. There's a lot of space between them mm -hmm. here. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely opportunities for um, a lot of infill to happen uh, with the existing zoning and without having to necessarily make that jump from low rise to mid rise, which has some additional concerns. So RA7 can be built without rezoning, right? On the surrounding site. So this particular site is an old DC2. Okay, um, well, yeah, this yeah, is DC2. So we definitely this, don't really So they would still that. require rezoning if, if they need to change from DC2 to RA7. Correct, yeah, and, and that was, you know, through the process and the application, that's what we encouraged the applicant, okay. applicant to consider is the RA7 zone as an alternative to the RA8 um, because we definitely don't want to see that 1984 DC2 going forward. It's probably not developable, yeah. developable okay. but yeah. 
So what did you hear from not, not staying with RA7, going to a um, higher densities or six stories? Just, just the business case doesn't make sense? Or like maybe that's a question to the applicant and the it new information? It could be. I mean, I, as you've heard today, we have a difference of interpretation yeah. with the city plan. So in their view, they, they saw the, the RA8 as, as also conforming with the city plan, which is different from us. But that was the reason given to us is that they, they felt that they had the policy uh, case to support the mm -hmm. RA8, yeah. and we disagree. Yeah, yeah. No, and and I, I, I think I, I respect the, the, the recommendation because you're following the policy, right? And uh, uh, even though the spectrum of kind of <laughs> how strongly you feel about it, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, it's, I understand that, right? So I, I'm getting that. So just that's where, okay, good. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, I'll take the chair back. Returned. Okay. All right. Any more questions to administration? Seeing none, at this time I will ask if council members have any questions to administration or to uh, the proponent uh, regarding any new information arising out of the previous discussion. Council Rutherford, can you take the chair? I have some questions to the... Uh, to the proponent, sure. I think I they're the probably gone online. They were all online, sorry. Uh, so just uh, uh, e to either one of you, why not R why not RS7, right? Uh, we feel that on this site, there's an opportunity to do something a little bit bigger. You know, it's as administration has stated, uh, that extra two stories won't have a major impact on the surrounding development. Um, also, you know, they mentioned that there is opportunity on the other side of the surrounding sites to increase density, but who knows how long that's going to take. Uh, this is a great opportunity to increase density in a location where it'll have very little impact in a neighborhood that's lost 40% of its mm -hmm. population in the last few decades. Mm -hmm. Has there been any opportunities presented to you? I know your clients own this piece of land, but kind of reimagining re the entire block, recognizing how much land is available and how sparsely kind of built it is? I don't know if any of the nearby buildings have come up for sale, but I can uh, let one of our clients speak to that. Yeah, Jeff, did you want me to speak to that? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, we're not aware of any uh, buildings that have come up for sale in the area. Um, uh, and and if these buildings are purchased, even it's a very very tight business case to do the development. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's it's very tight with with the build costs going up right now, and and it's a longer term strategy for for most people, right? We're trying to uh, make this business case work, um, or else we would you know we would have to consider maybe leaving the building as is. No, oh, I see. Uh, which so, so that, that, that's one of the main reasons for the RA8 zoning. Oh, I see. So RA7 would not work for you from a, from a business point of view, right? You need that higher two-story density, an additional two stories to make it, ha make it work. Right. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, with that, I don't see any more questions. Uh, at this time, we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move closure of the public hearing. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Council Salvador and Rutherford. We have all the votes. Can you display the votes, please? Okay. That is. Just for the clerk, I'm present as well, too, and I vote yes. It wasn't coming up. Okay. Thank you, Constance. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading 
Right. So can we can we yeah. make sure that we are including council agents? Okay. Council okay. Stevenson, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. I'll move first reading of item 3.22. Okay. Second. Second by Councilor Nack. Okay. We have first reading on the floor. Uh, now to speak, uh, Councilor Paquette. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, this is a, an interesting one, and uh, I can see where uh, we've got the, the friction. Um, it's, it, it is informative to hear about the, the business case, but uh, ultimately I'm looking at this as a land use case. Um, and so I feel that I'm actually also, if there's a spectrum of support to non-support, I'm pretty close to, to 55, 45. And uh, I can see why counselors will absolutely support this. Myself, I probably won't be supporting it. Um, simply because um, if it's just a land use conversation, um, devoid of everything else, um, it doesn't actually fit into the city plan. Um, the way that it's structured and not to be too dogmatic about it, but there are actually reasons for that. And I understand that if you have a fuzzy edge, then maybe that's not the end of the world. Um, but at the same time, if everything's a fuzzy edge, I'm not sure where we uh, have the, you know, the cohesiveness of a plan anymore. And uh, so those are the reasons that I'm leaning toward non-support. Um, along with all of the other reasons mentioned, I can see where a person would want the support because it's a valid argument uh, that uh, if there is no other development uh, coming in the foreseeable future, there is that risk of a continually decreasing population in the area, which becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy about amenities going into the area. Um, so that is uh, a very strong argument in my opinion. Um, additionally, uh, if uh, if you're just looking at something that would spur interest in development, then getting a development started would actually probably be pretty conducive to that. The problem then becomes what if you get other people coming in to take a look and be like, well, six stories. Well, why can't I do that? I, I want to do that too. Or I want to go to eight stories. And it becomes a little bit of that um, you know, slippery slope, which may or may not materialize. Um, and it all ultimately depends on the will of the council on what they want to support or not. But um, what I have seen is that at least psychologically, devoid of the legal argument, once you see um, something go in that uh, goes beyond the bounds of what was uh, previously uh, zoned or allowable, sometimes you see that, that, uh, that, that those plans get a little bit stretched and uh, you get a little bit of a different uh, process development than you had planned for, which may not be conducive to the development of our nodes and corridors. So a lot of arguments for and against, um, and I don't know if I'm convincing myself to vote for or not, but uh, we'll see ultimately the vote. I'd love to hear what uh, my colleagues have to say. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Constable Pickett, Constable Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Soki. Um, so I'm going to respectfully disagree with my colleague. I, I actually don't think this one is hard at all. Um, I think this is a, a clear yes, um, and, and I'll explain why we should support this. Um, I think the city plan, I, 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 I understand maybe how administration came to their conclusion a bit, but my read of the city plan is very different about that notion of a local node. And I think especially where you already have a zoned area that is zoned for low rise building, to have a, a mid rise building that is interior to the other low rise buildings, which would allow for a transition even to the neighboring single family homes is not is not hard uh, to, to advance at all. Um, I, I'm, I, I will say I, I'm actually a little concerned about how rigid the interpretation is of the of the local node conversation um because i think there's unfortunately i would argue there's not enough communities like this that already have low-rise buildings interior to the community i represent a handful of communities where you have low rises like this surrounding that park site but that's still the exception to the rule and not the rule so where we already have it i, I definitely don't see a problem of asking for two more stories um, when it's going to be adjacent to other low-rise low buildings. 
And and I think we, you know, I'll, I'll I see the ward councillor who has moved this will will offer their own remarks, but I I would defer to, to some of their uh, guidance on this as well. But when I look at the zoning in this community, this community is heavily zoned for a uh, single family home and not apartments. So if you actually look at um, what the current zoning is, I think besides the DC that was approved a couple of years ago, right on 111th Ave, um, there's no other um, low rise zoning uh, or even older buildings along the corridors that you might use in the first place. So, so this is actually a very unique situation in that the density in this community from the start was always built in the interior. Uh, which again, I think reinforces why we should should advance this. But I think more broadly, and again, that's just something I think the part I, I, I don't want us to lose sight on is um, we can't we can't be so focused on putting low rise or or multi unit buildings on the corridors and exclusively on the corridors. I, I think that again, this is I think it was mentioned in the presentations, and I think I've, I've been one of the ones that said it, which is that, I, I'm, we need to make sure that people who want to live in different types of homes can do that in all communities and not always be forced to the exterior of the community. Um, and we have to absolutely be willing to take in context and, and recognize that there's transitions and recognize that there needs to be thoughtful, um, there's a thoughtful design. But again, especially in this context, there's, it's not like this is up against a single family home and we're asking for a six story building. That's not what's before us. And that might play out different in other communities where we're having a conversation like this. Um, but but I, I love the idea of actually being able to get some more modern buildings interior to at least a handful of communities so folks can start to have choices to live in other parts of the city uh, you know, beyond Oliver at this point right now, you want to, or Strathcona, you want to live in a modern apartment building, you can go to two spots in the city right now, and you don't really have a lot of options elsewhere, uh, except oddly enough in some of the suburban neighborhoods. Um, so, so I think this is a very, for me, a very easy thing to, to support. Uh, I, well, I'll, I'll keep an open mind to hear the ward councillor at the end, I, uh, unless there's something really compelling, this is, uh, this is, uh, I, I mean, I saw it from the beginning, I, I can't see why we wouldn't be advancing this and giving people a modern building in the middle of a community across from a park site in a community that doesn't have much in terms of development on the corridors in the first place that is adjacent to a lot of hot, like, and I appreciate that the, the arguments, well, maybe you wanna have commercial around there. This is a community that you don't have to walk very far to get to a major grocery store, to a lot of amenities, to a lot of services. So again, even from that perspective, I think the commercial is already there. It might not be right in the middle of the community, but it's it's within a very short walk of the community. And so folks living here will have that option to go into those CB2 sites that really border Kingsway, uh, Kingsway Boulevard or Kingsway Avenue or whatever the name of the road is. Um, but uh, I, I just, I hope that this, that if this is supported and I hope it is, that administration uses that to help inform how they look at future applications because I, I'm a little worried it was a little bit too much of a rigid focus on this. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Before I go to Councillor Jans and Councillor Stevenson, I want to welcome some guests who are visiting us from Mayo Command School with their teacher, uh, Mrs. K. Anderson and they are from your ward counselor is counselor tang ward garheo thank you so much for joining us uh are you here for just for the day or just for one yeah, half, a half a day i i understand you're also be doing mock council right yeah one of your uh, uh the person who is going to be the mayor. What's your name? If Raz, right? Your dad is Amin. Yeah, he sent me a note actually that you're coming to City Hall. Yeah, he told me that you'll be the mayor for a day, right? So yeah, cool. Nice to see you. Nice to. Good. What are you going to talk about? Oh, whether public transport. 
but whether public transit should be free or not, Councillor Paquette. That's the topic of discussion that kids are having that are joining us from Yokeman School. Right. It's uh, a big question, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. And I actually grew up in Mill Woods, and I will tell you our joke, because I went to Wakota, was uh, Mayokeman? No, you may stay out. <laughs> That's a thinker. Hmm. Have you had discussion already on that topic, or are you going to have that discussion? Oh, what did you decide? Mr. Mayor, you want to come down here? <laughs> come on, come on down, come on down to the mi microphone. Okay, tell us what you uh, what, what, what your decision. Um, our decision was that we were against public transportation being free, because the cons outweighs the pros, because taxes would rise, dangerous people would be able to get on the LRT and disrupt the peace. It would also cost us more money to expand the LRT, so more people would be able to ride it. Mm, okay, so less money. Yeah. Less revenue being generated, less ability to expand the system. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Cool. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy your stay and uh, and uh, nice to nice to see you all. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we carry on. Councillor Jans, please go ahead. Thank you. Just very quickly, I want to say I think this is a fantastic proposal. I'm actually. Um, I would like to follow up offline with administration more about their thinking because I agree with Councillor Mark. I think it's very congruent with city plan. Um, I, uh, I, if, if, if I had to sum it down for one thing for me, it would be I love the interior uh, opportunity on the site with the local context you know, within, within you know, 10 or 20 steps from the site. I, mm -hmm. I love that you keep building apartments on main drags and corridors that continue to force people to breathe polluted there and to. Uh, you know, there's a reason we're seeing rising rates of childhood asthma, et cetera. Um, if you are on, say, 111th Avenue, leaving your patio doors open in the summertime heat, it's not really an option because of the noise and the pollution and the, the deteriorating quality of life. This, offered, this offers uh, an opportunity to have a beautiful home close to green space and the context of a wonderful community with a lot of amenities really, really close by. I mean, one of the best playgrounds in Edmonton and Inglewood is just a few steps away. So I... Um, I enthusiastically support this proposal and uh, yeah, look forward to, uh, look forward to the vote. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you very much. And Councillor Jans, you gave away the best kept secret in, uh, in the ward I represent. So I know you can't respond to that, but I just want to be really quick. I will be supporting this as well, but I agree with a lot of the same uh, concerns that Councillor Paquette raised. And I and I'm constantly reminded about this idea of trust. And, and I get that this is something I kept through listening, going back and forth. Uh, but I did go back and look at the central district plan. And this does have a local node, which I don't really think it's clear to the general public what that actually means in terms of development around a local node or when it becomes a local node. But also... Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't a place that was identified for that kind of density either as a phase in or not it's so interior um, to the city but I've been there I've, I actually have family that lives in the apartment complex just adjacent to this and I do know that this will fit in that context within that situation but I also worry about you know this tone that administration is reading this too hard lined I think that they are, often told by council, you know, we need to maintain public trust and we're creating these plans and these details so that the public has a surety. And if, if we are gonna change something that it does come to public hearing. And I think it's very rare um, for administration to non-support something. And so I think that that wasn't a decision that they take in any way lightly. And, and I appreciate it because it brings up 
further conversation. I'm not sure this item would have been selected or even debated or as thoughtfully discussed with a support motion from administration. And so I appreciate and really want to thank administration for the courage it took to, to make that interpretation. Uh, we can make a different interpretation at council, but I uh, really appreciate that. And I wanted to, to make that known publicly, but I will be supporting this because within the con of this specific site, I do think it makes sense. And I think it will fit there really nicely. And it will do, as Councillor Knack has said before, you know, allow real close access, not only to the green space right adjacent, but there is a bike path that takes you right onto Linear Park and Rocket Ship Park and all of that right behind and in close proximity too. So I think it'll be a great addition to that area, but uh, I completely understand how we got here. And I don't want administration to be discouraged from continuing to challenge us and applicants based on what is outlined in the city plan and the district plans when they're approved. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Yes, I have the chair. Thank you. I also want to thank administration for, uh, you know, coming with the recommendation that they are coming with because it is their responsibility to uh, follow the policy that has been approved by uh, by by council. So I think it's very important that we get to uh, hear that and uh, and see your analysis uh, in a very impartial, policy driven driven way. Right, even though you know spectrum of uh, analysis and how much the opposition is can 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 vary but i think it's very important as council rutherford has suggested that uh, that instead of you making that decision it be brought to council and then council to up uh, for to uh, to uh, to consider uh, i'm going to also support this because i think it does make sense uh, uh, on 116 street is a uh, is a collector road but it's a uh, Quite, quite used collector road. I, uh, uh, I, I remember traveling on that road quite, quite often, uh, and also close proximity to uh, to the green space, uh, as well as the uniqueness of the entire block. And maybe this could act as a catalyst for the rest of the uh, old buildings to be uh, reimagined uh, in in a in in a different light. And also, hundred eleven. Uh, avenue being uh, uh, the primary corridor and this being block and two block and half two block and uh, within two blocks away from that right I think again I think si recognizing the uniqueness it uh, uh, I can understand how applicant arrived at their interpretation of the uh, the city plan uh, so uh, but I think this is a good debate this is a good discussion to be had with uh, uh, among council members and with the administration to uh, uh, understand uh, as we getting into more district planning uh, work that how would that will uh, that will pan out. So, but I really I really wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the I I don't dispute administration's uh, analysis on this, right? And I also don't dispute uh, applicants' analysis on this. But these are kind of gray areas that sometimes we have to decide on, right? And here it is in front of us to make that decision. Good. Good. And I will be supporting it. Yep. Uh, Councillor Stevenson to close. Thank you so much, uh, and thanks to my colleagues for for the robust conversation. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Gretzky, which is not something I often get to do at public hearing, but I think um, you know there's something very apt in what he says around uh, going to where the puck is going, not where it is. And I think that really speaks to one of the fundamental tensions that I've heard today is just, you know, are we, are we planning for, for current conditions or, or what the future will look like? So, you know, I, I personally, in my reading of our existing policy, both at city plan and the draft district plans, for me, this does, does fit um, the definition of a local node. Um, there is commercial, there's existing zoning that allows mixed use with RA7, which does allow commercial and, and residential uses. Um, there's a large civic space, uh, which is granted outdoors, but still a considerable meeting point and hub for, for the community. 
Um, the specific site is on a collector road, um, and given the surrounding RA7 zoning, I think is very contextually appropriate. Um, but I really take to heart the point that my, my colleagues have made around the importance of trust and ensuring that there is shared um, and consistent understanding with uh, community members. This is part of the reason why I had made the subsequent motion as part of our urban planning, uh, urban planning committee conversation last week around potentially removing uh, the current geographic markers of local nodes. I can appreciate that, um, you know, if someone had looked at the district plan, saw that this area hadn't been indicated with a red star, that they may have felt that that meant, well, this is, you know, this is not a local node, there won't be any change there. Um, I think what this example really highlights is that local nodes are our nuanced evaluation. There are, there is a checklist, there's, there's factors, there's, um, elements that need to exist, but I think it's more nuanced than can happen at a, at a district planning level. You know, a contrast that I would flag um, is, you know, looking at another area of my ward in Riverdale. Um, uh, Dog Patch has, has a star, it's been highlighted as a local node. Um, and on that site, there are, you know, I think three to four businesses. Um, and at this site, there are roughly three to four, four businesses. Um, I think that when we're looking at neighborhoods at a very high level, again, especially at the district level, it can be hard to, to find that nuance. So I think that the next iteration of district plans will hopefully avoid some of that, that miscommunication or um, ensure that there's a consistent approach and a nuanced approach that can be taken to evaluating and looking at each local node. Um, yeah, also just want to echo the thought as well that I think in addition to, to meeting all the characteristics of a local node being contextually appropriate, there is also, yeah, this is a great opportunity for there to be some multifamily housing in the interior of a neighborhood. I think providing housing options is a core tenant of city plan and that means um, not just the unit type but the type of unit and, and the location uh, that it can be found in. Um, yeah, and again, I think I think this also speaks to the tension of future-focused planning. It would be really wonderful if if planning was linear, and we sort of had that small commercial site redevelop first, then maybe had some of those existing RE seven sites redevelop, and then this uh, development come forward. But city building is a much messier process. Um, change happens at the pace of individual property owners and the many factors that that go in to make their project viable. Um, and that, that linear sequence, I think, works as well forward as it does backwards. So again, you could have the commercial first, then the four stories, then the six stories. But, you know, as was mentioned by a colleague, maybe having that six stories first then helps the commercial happen, which then helps the further redevelopment of some of those older buildings. So um, in this sense, I, I still feel that it's, it's a really appropriate progression and, and way to move forward with our planning objectives. So I encourage all of my colleagues to support this and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, now to the second Thank reading. Thank you. I'll move second reading. Second. Second by Councillor Knack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading. Second. Okay, please vote. We have, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That, oh. Sorry, just to confirm, Councillor Paquette, did you Paquette, want to- Councillor Paquette, are you 
I was voting against uh, consideration for third reading. Uh, that's a yes for me. Will we call the vote? Okay, can we'll, we'll, we'll vote again. We call the vote on reconsideration. And please vote for the reconsideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Well, consideration is granted. So I'll move consideration of third reading. Yeah. Seconded by Councillor Nack. Yes, indeed. Okay, please vote for the final reading. <laughs> Consideration been already given, so you move third reading. So this is the final reading we're voting on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Third reading is on the floor, so please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, we have one additional speaker uh, on item 3.23. So we will add Keith Walker in opposition to 3.23. Okay, we are on to item 3.23. Uh, no one is in favor. There are two folks in opposition. We do need two speakers in favor, Mayor Sophie. We do, I don't have them on the list. Correct. Can I'm get sorry. an updated list for you? We can print an updated list, okay. um, but we do have two speakers in favor. Okay. All right. So we'll go to administration for a presentation. Uh, please go ahead. Good afternoon. This application proposes to rezone a site in the Montrose neighborhood from the CNC neighborhood convenience commercial zone to a DC2 site specific development control provision. It is the intent of the applicant to put a small addition on the existing building and operate a women's community health center. Under the new zoning bylaw, the existing CNC zone would become the CN neighborhood commercial zone. So administration's analysis and recommendation is based on the differences between the future CN zone and the proposed DC2 provision. Next slide, please. The site is located along 120th Avenue, north of Montrose Park, which includes the Montrose Community League building, a hockey rink, playground, spray park, and sports fields. The Montrose School is no longer in operation. There is access to bus service along 118th Avenue. Next slide, please. The site contains an existing building that does not conform to the front and interior side setbacks of the future CN zone regulations and will become legal non-conforming under the new zoning bylaw. This slide shows the street view of the site looking south from 120th Avenue. The site is located at the center with residential development on the right and commercial on the left. Next slide, please. The purpose of the DC2 zone is to allow for low intensity commercial uses in a building that is slightly bigger than that would be allowed under the current zone. Under the proposed DC2 provision, the site would have an approximately 20% increase in allowable floor space from the CN zone. The DC2 zone also removes several potential uses from the site, including bars, cannabis, liquor stores, and restaurants. Next slide, please. Administration sought feedback from the public through information on the city's webpage, mailed notices, and site signage. Three responses were received, including a response from the Montrose Community League. Some of the main concerns we heard were regarding the increased parking and traffic congestion, concern for safety of children, and increase in property taxes and more zoning changes in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This application aligns with the city plan's big city move of community of communities direction to enable Edmontonians quicker access to services and amenities throughout the city and within a shorter travel distance from their homes and within their neighborhoods. Next slide, please. In closing, administration is in support of this application because it uses a DC2 provision to allow for the reuse, reuse and expansion of an existing building in a manner that ensures the uses and built form are compatible within the neighborhood in alignment with the direction from the city plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll say Gil Hui to answer questions only. Present. Uh, James 
uh, Stafford to answer questions only present. Uh, any questions to uh, the applicant? Folks in favor of the application. Colleagues, any questions? Seeing none, then we'll go to uh, folks in opposition. Uh, Ahila Chandra on behalf of uh, Pranita Chandra joining us in person. Please come up here. And Keith Walker joining us remotely. Go ahead, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, so uh, uh, please go ahead. You wanna, if you wanna sit down, you can come on that side, sit down as well, you sure? Just, just turn the, uh, speak, uh, okay, go ahead. What are your questions, sorry? This one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, just a correction, it's Pranita Chandra speaking on behalf of Ahila Chandra. Oh, okay. So you, you're Pranita, right? I'm Pranita. Okay, good, okay. all right. Um, so we do have concerns about having the health center in the med middle of a residential area. For example, how will medical waste be collected, stored, and disposed of safely? We are close to a park as well as an ice rink and a skate park. There are children and families that kind of come and go as they please. Um, in addition, we do have concerns about the increase in traffic this will cause. The road directly in front of this residence is not along the main street, but is separated from the main road by a grass strip. Once what residents have parked along the road, it essentially becomes a one lane road. This road is rarely plowed or sanded or graved um, in the winter. It becomes icy. Many residents get their cars stuck in this area. With the increase in traffic, um, if these individuals that are coming to uh, the health center it, and if they get stuck it'll dispute the sorry it'll disrupt the flow of traffic along this road and cause issues for the current residents that live there um, there's also currently issues with parking for residents it is uh, difficult to find parking on a regular basis for those that live there with people if Residents have visitors coming. Um, the residents that live there do have issues with finding parking in front of their house. In addition to this, the back alley is significantly deteriorated and increases in traffic flow may cause further damage to the alley. Uh, there are also issues currently with the drainage system in the area. During heavy uh, rainfall, um, the street itself does get flooded regularly as well as um, there are many residents have had the sewer back up into their basements. With the addition of a health center, this will put further additional pressure on this drainage system in the area. For us currently, the increase requested for this height will re reduce the sunlight that our landscaping, flower beds and vegetable gardens receive in the summer. We're also looking at um, redoing our shingles and looking at options to install solar, solar panels to reduce our energy that we are using. By increasing this residential area, it'll impact the amount of sunlight we are able to receive. Lastly, the rezoning of this raises concerns on the impact to property taxes of the homeowners in this area. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, don't go yet. You can grab a seat on that side if you want to. Good, you sure? Okay. Uh, we're gonna go to Keith Walker next. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Mayor. I, hi, hello, City Councilors, and hello, Pranita. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, this we is can. My first... We can. Yeah. Good. Uh, so I had uh, drafted up a letter with my wife, Sabrina O'Donnell. Uh, we own the property directly to the east of the property in question. Um, so we will be directly affected by this proposed development. So I'm just gonna write this, uh, read this letter out kind of ver verbatim if you don't mind. I hope this letter finds you well. I'm writing to express my concerns regarding the rezoning application submitted by our new neighbors for the property located at 6011 120th Avenue. As an owner resident of 6007 120th Avenue, I believe it is essential to bring your attention to the potential impact this rezoning may have on our property and the surrounding neighborhood. 
Firstly, one of our primary concerns is the invasion of privacy that may result from the proposed changes. A plan to construct, as we, as we understand it, a taller and deeper building raises the possibility of overlooking into our backyard, infringing upon our privacy. Additionally, the increased size of the building could severely block daylight into our property, negatively affecting the quality of our life for our family and our rental tenants, as well as our lush landscaping, very similar to what Pranita had mentioned earlier. Um, I'd also like to add with the oversize of the building going higher and deeper as we understand this proposal is, I think it's deceiving um, that it's a 20% increase, okay? So as the, as, as the building sits now, it's already, um, it, it extends beyond our building in the back 10 feet. So, you know, it's already a 1500 square foot building on one floor, 1500 on the other, roughly. It's a 3000 square foot building. But from what I understand is it's gonna extend almost 40% as long towards the back alley. Um, Anyway, I digress, here we go. Uh, here's more of my letter. Furthermore, we are troubled by the lack of architectural drawings provided for public review without sufficient information on the proposed changes. It is challenging for us to assess the potential impact on our property and the overall aesthetic of the neighborhood. We request that detailed architectural plans be made available for public scrutiny before any decisions are made. Another significant concern is the potential devaluation of neighboring properties, ourselves included. The proposed changes may make our property less appealing to potential buyers, resulting in a decrease in property values. We believe that a thorough assessment of the impact on property values should be conducted before any rezoning decisions are made. Uh, moreover, we are apprehensive about the rezoning application being tied to a specific proposal submitted by our neighbors. If the rezoning is approved and the proposed development does not proceed, there's a risk that an alternative project, uh, even more so potentially conflicting with the character of the neighborhood could take, uh, could, could be taken in its place. This uncertainty poses a threat to the stability of our community and in particular, our business interests. Uh, one other significant uh, concern we have, which uh, Pranita also touched on, relates to the current state of the storm and sewer infrastructure in the neighborhood. Over the seven years that we've been here, we have observed the existing infrastructure is aging and at times struggles to keep up with the demands of the current properties. Given the proposal, expansion and increased capacity of the building located at 6011 20th Ave, we worry that the strain on the already aging sewer system could result in potential damage and a heightened risk of flooding, especially for our building. It is crucial that any proposed changes to the property include necessary upgrades to the storm and sewer infrastructure to mitigate the potential adverse effects on the neighborhood. Uh, in light of these concerns, we kindly request the city council ensures that the rezoning approval is contingent upon the specific plans submitted by our neighbors. If they decide not to move forward with their proposed development, the rezoning should be reconsidered to prevent any adverse consequences for the neighborhood. Thank you for the attention to this matter. We trust that the city council will carefully consider the impact on these residents and, and fellow business people in the community before making any decisions regarding this rezoning application. Thank you. Um, we Thank you. Uh, almost one second, uh, one second, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Uh, we had also submitted this in an email format with some pictures accompanying it. I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at them yet. Okay. But there is a you know a hard copy that was sent out um, showing some of the flooding that happens around this area, okay. as well as the actual um, buildings in question. All right, thank you. Thank you, so you again for thank your time. Thank you so much. Questions now, colleagues? Questions to uh, uh, Bernita Chandra or Keith Walker, Councillor Salvador? Go ahead, please. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to both our speakers for taking the time to uh, to share their perspectives today. And um, yeah, I have a few questions uh, and I'll start with uh, speaker Chandra. Um, you know, you you mentioned that uh, right off the top, you have a concern around having a health use uh, or health services in this location. Um, but my, my understanding is that even with the current zoning, um, health uses or health services are a permitted use um, and they would be a permitted use even if nothing changes and this doesn't go forward today they'd be a permitted use under the new uh, cn zone in the new year so just your thoughts on on that piece um i wasn't aware that it can be currently used as a health center um it's not currently used for that purpose right now so if going forward it, it does start being used as a health center again the concerns are how is medical waste human waste going to be stored and disposed of safely um what's the regular scheduling for that to happen what impacts will that have going forward on the residents in the area okay okay so it's sort of the the logistics associated with that potential use right. um but but recognizing that that use is um is allowed today and would be allowed even if this doesn't go forward um okay Question about um, infrastructure. So heard both speakers speak to uh, concerns around drainage, uh, sewer. Please correct me if I'm wrong. When did Montrose go through neighborhood renewal? It wasn't that long ago. I wanna say about three or four years ago. Right, right. Okay, yeah, and I guess just, I can ask this to administration as well, but questions there around uh given how recent the neighborhood renewal was done um probably shouldn't be having those types of issues and um that seems like it could be a, a secondary conversation that i can absolutely follow up on uh, but how do you see that related to this direct land use and this rezoning are you asking me to oh, sure yeah i can address that to speaker walker well, uh, just going back to the neighborhood renewal thing, I know for a fact, as I was here when it was happening, it was a curb and gutter situation. It wasn't uh, sewer and water stuff. So it was sidewalks and curbs and asphalt. But uh, getting to why maybe we think that this would increase problems, more toilets, more problems. You know, I mean, if if the client or the proposal of the of the you know the client in question or the the neighbor in question that wants to expand out this building, uh, I can only imagine that there's going to be more plumbing added to that as well. And so, we're we're concerned about that. <laughs> That's, that's sure sure so. yeah i really i appreciate that and i can ask administration around um the ability of the infrastructure to withstand uh you know additional toilets flushing etc cetera, etc cetera. uh so thanks for that piece um you might then, chuckle you might chuckle about it but once you see those photos <laughs> that we submitted you won't chuckle it's a serious thing around here people get flooded yeah. Oh, I I absolutely know that flooding flooding is a, an issue in a number of these neighborhoods, whether or not that's tied to um, these types of, of projects and rezoning decisions. Um, you know, I think that's that's a good question for administration. Um, and then just the piece around actually, maybe this might be directed towards legal, but uh, both speakers brought up concerns around the devaluation of neighboring properties or what that might mean for property taxes uh, in the area. Uh, that's not something that we can factor into our decision, is it? Yeah. Cool. Councillors, Jamie Johnson here. Yeah, we look at uh, impacts and improvements or degradation of the community as a whole. We don't look at the on-site valuation of neighboring properties. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that piece. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that, that, was helpful. I, I have some good questions for administration based on what I heard from the speakers. So um, I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Wright. I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll ask Mr. Walker. Um, in the in the report that administration provided, it, I mean, the, um, the sto storm and sewer um, concerns were addressed. Um, and, and there are sort of protections in place. I guess part of it is, uh, and I don't know if you're aware 
in the report that it says that the applicant owner will be responsible for all costs associated um, you know, to enhancing the existing water structure infrastructure. Does that give you any more reassurance? I'm trying to think how that's even possible, given that it's the city infrastructure that's in question here, not the not the building. No, but if, if somebody if if a um, if a, a if an owner or developer is going to to build something bigger than what the the city's water system can handle, then they would be responsible for upgrading that. And there, there's also a, a um, sort of a, a clause in here as well that because that building right now has no storm service connection, um, that they'll have to also make sure that they've got a, a low impact development going up there or they will have to make sure that they've got the proper water and sewer in there. So I'll just confirm that with administration. And, and I think you also had some concerns about the height well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Cur cur like, currently it's, it's our, our, our place is the turquoise building to the, to the east of it, and currently, you know, they're the same height. So they're potentially talking about a third story and extending a further, from what I understand, another 30 feet-ish out the back, 40 feet out the back, almost to the alley. This is gonna. This is gonna create tunnel vision. This is gonna devalue our property, no matter how you look at it, no matter how you slice it. So that's why I, I, I have to talk about this today. You know, I feel like we, we, if that had been there when we had kind of came, this property, the the, the one that we purchase the one that we've invested in this would not have been something that we wanted to do if this, if this proposed development was already here the reason we chose of course our house or our building is because we saw the openness the potential the cell facing etc okay because um, and i know councillor rutherford also or not rutherford sorry salvador noted um about the 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 current uses and what that would become in um, as of January 1st, and and the height actually on on this property would also be increased to, to 12 meters, which is what the um, the proponent is proposing. So I, I I'm just I don't know by you know how this would would change. The well, situation. I'm going down swinging. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I mean, if what I'm getting from what you're saying is that Keith, it's nice that you're having this conversation, but just so you know. It's all going to happen anyway in January, then fair enough. And, and but I have to talk about it. I yeah. have to say our piece, right? Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing those concerns forward because I'm sure there's others in the community that do have them and and Ms. Chandra's here as well, I think, with those same concerns. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just wondering... Well, I'm, well yeah, you go. I'm you just... Go. Um, the minimum setback as well. I know you're talking about it going... Um, sort of, you know, how, how it's being extended out to the alley. But I think there is a restriction for six meters um, setback, which there isn't right now. So I don't know if, if that'll maybe help um, with those concerns about it being like a, a full, like th there's not going to be a building on the full um, land. There, there are some restrictions to, to reduce the size of it. So I'll, I'll, right. I'll double well, check with, with administration how that will flush out well I'm okay. sure a, a, a variance will take care of that possibly okay. but thanks um okay. I'm less concerned actually about the use of the building and more concerned about why we can't work with the 3,000 square feet that the building represents currently and maybe I can ask that of the proponent then oh. when there's a chance okay thank you my time is is up okay Thank you, Councillor Wright and Councillor Principe to uh, questions to administration. Councillor Rutherford, can you take a chair? I just have a quick question. I maybe this could be a question to the uh, to the applicant as well. Uh, but I want to know if uh, yeah, Speaker Pranita Chandra or Keith Walker, uh, the the health facility or health services that will be 
located there if this goes ahead. They're regulated by the provincial government, right? And I'm pretty sure provincial government has some regulations around disposal of uh, uh, whatever material that needs to be disposed, right? I, I I'm just I'm just wondering. Like they may may have some regulations around that, right? Do you are you aware of any regulations, or maybe we need to ask that question to the to the applicant? I'm not aware of the mic, your mic, your mic. Go ahead. Go ahead um, now. I'm not aware of any of what the exact regulations are, but how does that impact the residents? I mean, if it's a truck coming in daily, is it a truck coming in mm -hmm. weekly? What does that do to people that are trying to get into the alleyway when they're there? How, what okay. is it, how does it disrupt our day to day? Yeah, we will ask definitely that question to the uh, to the applicant on the on the condition of the al so alley back alley is pretty quite deteriorated. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that neighborhood renewal program, uh, your community benefit from that, we will have questions around drainage. Uh, I, I think you could also find out when your neighborhood is up for renewal for the back alleys as well, right? Maybe I, our administration may not have that answer now, but we, you can definitely follow up with that through uh, your ward counselor to get uh, the information when that will come because we have a dedicated resources for alley renewal as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry, can I just ask a question? So in that I'm case, sorry, the process doesn't work that way, but you can, um, I'll ask you a question, maybe you can formulate your question in a form of answer, right? So <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess the concern is if that's the, if that's the way, uh, because there's an increase in traffic, there will be an increase in traffic if this goes through, does that cycle of when that alley gets renewed change? Okay, I'm sorry, say, say that again, I missed it. So right now, like, the, with if our alley is renewed yeah. and clearly paved with an increase, with additional traffic coming through because more people are gonna be coming into the area to come to this health center, does that cycle, I don't know if it's like a four year or five year cycle, does that get changed because there is an increase in traffic flowing into that area? Yeah, we will ask about the amount of traffic that will be generated by this facility as well, right? There may, there may be nominal traffic depending on uh, uh, the, the, the use, right? But we'll definitely ask those questions. Thank you so much for both of you for uh, for, for joining us. Really appreciate your input into, uh, into this. And now we will, uh, go to questions to uh, to administration. All right, questions to administration. Councilor Salvador? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so a few questions arising from uh, some of the concerns shared by speakers. And I should also mention, um, received a letter from the Community League Executive as well in Montrose. A number of those concerns were reiterated by speakers today, so I might uh, ask them all at once. Um, so why don't we start with uh, infrastructure capacity, sewer and water, um, you know, hearing concerns that the additional uh, pressure on the system uh, might cause issues. Looking for some thoughts there from Edmund. Councilor, the infrastructure here is constrained. Uh, the only available option is a 200 millimeter pipe, which is adequately sized for the sanitary flows. So keeping that in mind for, when, for this application, no additional stormwater is being directed to that pipe directly. So what the administration has uh, done is uh, put in a requirement for a low impact development, uh, which will contain the stormwater, and then it will be released on the surface. Uh, it's not a fix to the wider problems in this area, but uh, it won't contribute any more to the problems uh, that exist in that area. Okay, and what will be the fix eventually, sort of the systemic fix for this area? Uh, this area is identified by EPCOR as an, uh, as an area that would need potential upgrades. Uh, right now, I'm not aware of any immediate plans for uh, infrastructure upgrades this in area, but it is identified as an area that would require some sort of upgrades in the future. Okay, so long term, 
uh, EPCOR would be leading those types of system-wide upgrades. Uh, but in the immediate term, I'm hearing from you that um, with the measures in place around the low impact development, uh, if this were to move forward, there would not be um, you know, additional negative consequences associated with that, more than already exist. That's correct. Okay. Um, and now I just wanna ask some questions just to tease out the comparison between what is allowed today, what is going to be allowed with the new zoning bylaw come the new year, and then what is proposed under the DC. So my, my read of this is that health services are allowed today uh, and they'd be allowed under the new zoning bylaw and they're consistent with what's proposed in the DC. Is that a correct understanding? That's correct, counselor. Okay, so health services could be in there tomorrow, theoretically. With the proper permits, yes, counselor. Yes, yes, of course. Um, and then in terms of the built form, uh, the height. So 12 meters is, that's already coming forward through the zoning bylaw, regardless of whether or not this were to be approved today. Correct. Okay, and can you help me understand the rear setback as well? I know Councillor um, Wright was asking some questions there. What's the difference between what's proposed and what is in the new zoning bylaw? So in the new zoning bylaw, the CN zone does not have a requirement for a rear setback. Uh, it's understood that there, it, it, the intent is to add some flexibility. It's understood there's probably going to be a setback in most cases to allow for parking or servicing and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not specifically restrictive on that. Under the proposed DC2 provision, uh, the required rear setback is six meters. And that's generally gonna bring it in line with uh, the setback that you see on the majority that's block. Um, at the east end and, and to the west, there's garages that basically have that uh, driveway um, going up to the garage and that's about a six meters. The typical parking space is five and a half meters. So it's essentially aligning it with the rest of the block. Okay, okay, so this wouldn't be sort of out of place, if you will. Um, it is consistent with what we're seeing on that block face, or well, rear block. Um, and in some ways, it's more generous than what would be allowed through the standard CN zone. That's correct. Uh, compared to the standard zone, the DC requires a setback that wouldn't otherwise be there. Right, right. Uh, okay, that's helpful. Maybe. Um, do we know when alley renewal is scheduled for Montrose? I was trying to pull that up. Or do we even have a, a date for that at this point? Councillor, we <clears throat> Councillor, we don't have a set timeline on it. It is definitely beyond 10 years horizon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let me just jump to the community league letter here. Oh yeah, around parking and traffic concerns. Um, maybe just on the flow of traffic. Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with that that particular road. Um, concerns around narrowing of it. Maybe potential opportunities for some curbside management in the future. So uh, the, the neighborhood renewal was finished in uh, in 2019, which did took, uh, take into account a few improvements. Uh, I don't necessarily see anything on the radar for this neighborhood uh, at this time. Okay, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a line of questioning. I'm gonna pick up on what uh, Councillor Salvador was asking. So currently, a health uh, services can be in there when ZBR in January goes through. It can be, and the propo uh, proposed uh, rezoning can be. So why are we here then today? Like why, maybe I'm not sure if I should ask administration or the proponent why this rezoning is necessary. So the rezoning uh, is necessary for the applicant in terms of meeting their intent. So they wanna build a larger building than what the CN zone on January 1st would allow. And so that's in terms of the total floor area. So under the CN zone, the floor area ratio would be two and under the proposed DC it would be 2.4. Uh, in addition, they also have stated the intent to reuse the existing building, which is not something that would be possible under the standard zone because the Municipal Government Act uh, does not allow you to put additions onto non-conforming buildings. And so because the existing building doesn't meet all the setback requirements of the CN zone, they wouldn't be able to build the addition that they're intending to do. So that's why uh, there's a DC. It's not so much about the use. Okay, good. So that makes sense to me now. And then I have another question. So when I look at the current, it's CNC, 
the existing zoning, yet it's residential? Currently, is the actual development there? That's correct. And is that? So sometimes there's historical oddities with, with how zoning bylaws have changed over time in terms of where the uses are. Uh, so the, the intent uh, is going forward, obviously, to have a commercial use, and I think it's fair to say the building was probably built uh, with a commercial intent uh, when it was initially I constructed see. also. I see, yeah, because it doesn't look like the zoning is, or the building yeah. is actually in line with the current zoning. Uh, well, it's probably it was built as a commercial building. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of different iterations of the neighborhood commercial zone over the last 50 years. Um, so it doesn't conform to the setbacks of today's zone. Presumably it was built with That's what I was going to say. In the picture, at, it doesn't look like it's conforming to the setbacks as well. Right, yeah. So I, I, it, the permit for this building would not have been under the current regulations of the CNC zone. Right. Okay, good. Yeah, that all makes sense to me now. Thanks. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Principal. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you so much. Just a few quick technical questions. Um, so often when, when we have rezonings to commercial, there's a requirement to upgrade the, the laneway. I'm assuming because this is already a commercially zoned property that that requirement doesn't come into effect? Or will they be required to upgrade the alley? It can be reviewed at the development permit stage, but uh, the scale of development is important in that case. Right. Uh, the size of the lot is fairly small. Uh, what we anticipate in terms of uh, additional trips, is it's in the realm of uh, 20 trips during the peak hour, which is, again, not a significant increase. So in all likelihood, uh, it will be done through the alley renewal program. Gotcha. No, that, that's fair. Um, just in terms of, uh, you know, the requirement for the, the on-site storage, uh, like the, the uh, rainwater on-site storage, I didn't notice that that was a provision in the in the direct control zone itself. Is that just a process in the EPCOR um, design review, or did I miss that? So if it was to be stored on site, then we will have to direct it to the small pipe that already exists. So sending any additional water to that small pipe is not a good option in this case. So what we are recommending is putting in an LID and then releasing it on surface. So the storage is going to happen in the form of LID. Sorry, the... In the form of LID. Okay, and I, I, I just don't see the LID requirement in the regulations of the zone. No, that'll be uh, done at the subsequent stages, uh, at the development permit stage. Uh, okay. We are exploring different LIDs. One option uh, we are looking at currently is whether uh, it can be done on the roof. Uh, Great. So there are different options being explored with EPCOR at this point. Okay, perfect. But, but again, those assurances are in place. Um, that's part of a process. Any new development has to show sort of their on-site storage to, to meet EPCOR requirements. Correct. Okay, great. Um, it also seemed that, again, there is space on the site plan for waste bin storage. I know that was raised in terms of there being adequate waste storage space. Um, it looks to me that, that 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 is accommodated on the site plan. That's right, Councillor. There's been uh, consideration of the amount of waste collection that they would need and space allocated for it. Okay, including medical waste. The zoning bylaw doesn't really get into that specifically. Um, like Mayor Sully mentioned, there's there's other uh, other legislative jurisdictions yeah. that deal with that. Great. I was interested. Oh, I mean, maybe just keeping with the sewer, the sewer impact. So I had a quick look online, and it looks like the population of Montrose has decreased from about 4,600 to about 3,200 since the 1970s. As a similar theme to a lot of neighborhoods like that, yes. Yeah, so in terms of some of, you know, especially the, the sewers, um, they were initially built for a much larger population and with higher flow. That's correct. The toilets. sanitary is not an issue. It's okay. uh, just that older neighborhoods were built to a different standard of storms, which we, we don't have uh, now. So, yeah. so storm water is an issue here. Great. And then I was interested to see that there were no residential uses included in the zone. Um, I'm assuming that's, you know, the applicant just didn't, didn't need those just wondering in terms of future proofing this again we see that these buildings have evolved over time uh, just some thoughts around that 
Yeah, so when we're doing a direct control, there's obviously a lot of um, back and forth in terms of trying to become more specific um, or, or leaving it for something that's, uh, I guess, future-proofed. Um, in this case, I think it shows a very clear intent from the applicant to do a specific thing and, and an attempt to try and address some of the concerns uh, that they heard about some of the compatibility. So um, there's a lot of commercial uses that are removed from the zone, uh, of mm -hmm. course. Um, so I don't think they have any intent of doing any, any kind of residential use going forward. Could it be in there? Uh, I suppose, but it wouldn't really add much. It's a very small site, so yeah. it's not like we're um, having a whole bunch of land that's going to be restricted uh, without that. Yeah, no, I think, I think uh, you know, we can have long conversations about direct control zones. I definitely see the value of using it in this situation and thinking about the future-proofing aspect. Maybe just a very last question. I uh, heard questions around the shadow. My, my assumption would be that sort of with this north-south orientation of the building, um, you know, that, that wouldn't necessarily, that would probably impede some um, evening sun, but, but most of the time the, the shadow impact probably wouldn't be too significant. In general, yeah. I mean, it's very fortunate in terms of sun access to have the park space to the south. Um, throughout the vast majority of the year, there's going to be lots of access to sun, uh, except for maybe the evening sun in the winter and the, the shoulder seasons. But even in the winter, directly the sun midday, you're still going to get some sun access here. So that's better than a lot of places. Okay, that's great. Thanks. All my questions. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. So the sanitary is not an issue. Storm water is. Uh, so at what time uh, the low impact uh, development that will have whatever the requirements that would be put in place would be put in, put in place at what stage? At the development permit stage. At the development permit, right? Uh, I think it's very important for public to understand that because sometimes you know people are concerned about these issues. They don't know when when will when that action will take place when whatever we are saying will be required. Subsequent to this, they will be, subsequent to the rezoning, they will bring in a development permit application yeah. wherein they'll have the details of the uh, increase in the building size and uh, the layout of the building. At that stage, uh, the, the LID features would be negotiated and then nailed down as to exactly Got how it works. Got it. On the, on the traffic, uh, uh, Faisal, you said 20 trips per during peak hour, or is it 20 trips per hour during peak hours, less during non-peak hours? 20 trips uh, during the peak hours. And per hour, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, like, this is just during the peak, and then it will be less uh, during off-peak hours. Okay. And this does not include anyone walking or taking a transit. Uh, so just to mention, um, on transit front, uh, this is the neighborhood that is served by both uh, regular service along 118, and also through on-demand transit. Oh, so the 20 trips are not necessarily vehicle trips, they're total trips. They are total trips. Oh, I see people walking, biking, taking transit, okay, so there's not a, okay, God, that, I think that's very important to uh, make that distinction as well, because uh, I thought, I the way I understood it was that 20 vehicle trips per, per during peak hours per hour, okay. That is good clarification. Uh, uh, I do have some questions to the to the applicant. We'll come under new information. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, okay, that concludes the question to administration. At this time, I will ask if council members have any questions uh, uh, are related to new information arising out of the previous conversation. Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to the applicant. So if, uh, could, if applicant, please come down. Just I'll just to stop your clock here, Councilor Salvador. Sure. There'll be Gil, Hui, and James Stafford. Stanford, sorry. Stafford, 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 yeah. Please come down. Uh, we have to add to the list. Who is that person? Can you please give them... Uh, uh, the, your name to the clerk, and I will add that to the list. Then we will start the proceeding. Okay. What is the name of the per, per, additional person, please? 
Shauna Stafford. Sh Shauna Stafford, okay. Shauna Stafford, okay, I'll move. Uh, so Shauna Stafford is added to the list of speakers in favor of the application. Okay, Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just to the applicant, uh, wondering if you can speak a little bit about, uh, I guess, why you're pursuing the addition in particular, um, the limitations with the existing space. I'd love to address that, thank you. We purchased the building originally hoping not to have to do too much to it, knowing we could put health facilities on the current zoning. Unfortunately, we went through an iterative process of design and realized that the type of patient care I'm hoping to provide to my patients is not feasible with the current size restriction. Specifically, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist with a special interest in obesity medicine. And for the proper care of my patients, I need larger hallways, larger exam rooms, larger equipment, um, easy access, particularly on the main floor. And in order to accommodate a lot of these um, bigger spaces that provide comfortable and safe care for my patients, as well as comfortable and safe spaces for providers to provide the care, um, we need more space. Um, when we maximize what we're able to do on the main floor, it therefore pushes other care spaces upwards, which is why we're hoping to have more space on the upper floors as well, so that the overall function of the clinic is realized. One of the big parts of our care is breaking down barriers to access for Edmontonians as well as persons in other parts of adjacent areas to Edmonton. And so we provide a lot of virtual care and that means that those aren't in-person patient visits to the clinic, but we do need space for providers to function in. And so that's some of that additional space on the upper floors that wouldn't increase traffic to the neighborhood, but does require increased floor space in which um, healthcare providers would be functioning. I hope that answers your question. That does. That was a really comprehensive answer, and I um, have a much better picture of of the intention for this site now. And um, yeah, I I can now see why you'd be pursuing that additional space, given that um, as you mentioned, if we're looking purely at uses, health services are allowed under the current zoning. But um, yeah, thanks for the context as to why you're you're looking for the additional space. Um, yeah, and then I also just had a question. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned future proofing and um, sometimes when we see DCs uh, come forward, um, we in recognition that they are long lasting um, zones that do not change as a standard zone would or evolve as a standard zone would. We would see things like residential uses, more flexibility in there. Um, but uh, can you speak to why you were quite specific with what, what the intention is, is here with this DC and, and even some of the commercial uses that were removed. I'm very junior in my career. Um, and so I guess from the my perspective, we're hoping and planning, unfortunately, to be working for a very long time. Um, and so we'll, we'll be using it for this intent for a very long time and the other side of it is that the need for this specific niche in medicine is not diminishing, it's growing at a rapid rate. And so while I would love to say that Edmontonians and Albertans won't need these services in the future, the reality is that I believe that the infrastructure we'll be putting in will be able to serve our community and Edmonton as a broader community for the long term. And so we're not we're looking to provide stability to the neighborhood. We're not looking to provide any confusion about our intent. Um, we're looking to be specific to hopefully settle anxieties about what we're up to for now and for the long term. Okay, great. So really, as you said, providing that stability, certainty, and surety to the neighborhood around what the intentions are. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Um, I think that's it from me for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, 
uh, Women's Community Health Center, uh, your proposal, that is regulated by the provincial government, right? So all um, healthcare is regulated yeah. through very specific bodies and different bodies manage different aspects of healthcare. And so we would conform to yeah. the so accreditation what, process. So whatever requirements are, and would those requirements also uh, be dealing with some of the concern you heard from the community around uh, medical waste, right? How is that disposed, collected, and, uh, uh, and disposed? Absolutely, there would be very minimal specific medical waste generated at a clinic like ours. Mm -hmm. Most of it would be typical waste that we yep. dispose of in the normal fashion. Um, and any specific medical waste would be um, regulated very tightly and disposed of at the current clinic I'm at, I think three to four times per year. Got okay. Well, so it's not that often, right? So okay. got it, okay. On the, uh, on the selection for this location, uh, Access to public transit was a consideration when you made that decision? Yes, we were hoping to serve Edmontonians in general, and many of our patients have the luxury of having a vehicle, but many of them don't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our patients increasingly are choosing to use bikes, walk, mm -hmm. and use transit. And so this was a very cool location that offered um, all of those opportunities because it is close to 118th Ave. Yeah. It's not that far from LRT usage. And for most of the year, it's a very walkable neighborhood. We also live in the neighborhood, so we're very familiar with all of those amenities. Okay. So you see the 20 trips that uh, the uh, the new addition will generate, or maybe the opening of the health center will generate, will come with diverse ways people will get there, right? That's right. Driving, walking biking, public transit? Certainly from a staffing perspective, a lot of it would come from walking and biking. Hmm. Okay, good. Thank you so much. That's all you needed to, needed to know. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes the questions on the new information. At this time, we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Counselor. Uh, Mayor Sohi, I'll move closure on Charter Bylaw 20701. Thank you. Need a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move uh, first reading of Charter Bylaw 20701. Second. Okay. All right. So we have the first reading of the bylaw on the floor. At this time, anyone to speak? If no, Councillor Salvador to close. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the speakers uh, who came out to join us today. I uh, really appreciated the conversation and the dialogue um, and, and hopefully some of the clarity that we were able to, um, to gather from uh, the answers that were provided by administration as well as the applicant. You know, when I look at look at this application, um, actually, my first my first question was a DC. Why a DC? Um, because typically, you know, I want to want to be tending towards conventional zones. Uh, but seeing the specifics of this site and knowing that it would become uh, essentially a non-conforming use under or, or non-conforming um, uh, building under the new zoning bylaw, I think a DC does make sense um, in this particular context. When I think about uh, the comparison between what is allowed now versus what would be allowed um, under the new zoning bylaw versus this DC, um, you know, I see consistency across uses. Health services are allowed today, uh, so it's not introducing a new use. Um, in my mind, it's really about facilitating um, 
as we heard from from the applicant, a feasible project. And uh, when I think about the infrastructure that's in place, um, I was confident in the answers provided by administration that uh, through the low impact development that will come through uh, through work with EPCOR, that those issues can be managed uh, while we wait for those long term systemic solutions um, and and upgrades to the neighborhood itself, uh, as well as alley renewal that uh, will be a ways off, but is that systemic fix? Um, yeah, in terms of the traffic generated, uh, really appreciated the clarity around the 20 trips during peak hours uh, and and specifically not necessarily car trips. You know, this is in a location where I can see folks being able to walk, bike, uh, take transit quite easily to access uh, what sounds like a very, very important um, and and critical uh, use that that all of Antonians need access to and, and deserve access to for um, for a variety of reasons. So uh, I will I will be supporting this and would encourage my colleagues to do the same. Um, from a city plan perspective, this particular location in Montrose really is uh, a bit of a local note. You know, it's. Um, a strip of commercial retail opportunity, mixed use opportunity um, in the midst of a, a larger mature neighborhood uh, while still being close to primary corridor um, just off 118th Avenue. So a great location, facilitates walkability um, and that 15 minute community concept. So uh, again, would encourage folks to support this and thank you for everyone uh, for speaking today. Thank you, Council Salvador. So we have a, a please vote for the first reading. Councilor Rutherford said yes. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Just waiting on two votes. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Jans. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move second reading of Charter Bylaw 20701. Second. Second by Councilor Wright. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Move consideration of third reading. Second. Yeah, please vote for consideration of third reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Consideration is granted. I'll move third reading of Charter Bylaw 20701. Second. Please vote for the final reading of the bylaw. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our agenda. Any notices of motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we are adjourned at 323.